Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and a very big welcome from me to all the attendees this afternoon uh, to this, the second uh, Renewable Hydrogen and Green Power Fuels webinar for South Africa. Um, my name is Chris Yelland, Managing Director at EE Business Intelligence. And I will be your host and moderator, signed in from Johannesburg. A big welcome to the British High Commissioner to South Africa, the Honorable Mr. Nigel Casey, and to the Minister of Trade, Industry and Competition, the Honorable Mr. Ibrahim Patel. And a big welcome to the fantastic lineup of presenters this afternoon all of whom will be introduced to you in due course. And of course, a big welcome to you, the attendees today, for your interest and participation. Please do note that this webinar is being recorded and a link to view the webinar on demand, as well as links to download all the presentations today, will be made available by email to all those who registered to attend the webinar as well as to the general public and the media. While the presentation is in progress, please do send us your questions and answers. And I'm reminded to switch my Q&A on, and I hope you have switched your Q&A on too. And uh, uh, so while the presentation is in progress, send us your questions on the Q&A text facility uh, and panelists and their support teams will be responding in the text chat facility to some of the questions during the course of the webinar itself. We've also set aside half an hour after the presentations for our expert presenters to answer some of the major questions. We will not be able to respond to all the questions during the Q&A session. At the first uh, Renewable Hydrogen and Green Power Fuels webinar for South Africa, on Tuesday, the 19th of February, a total of 1,500 persons registered to attend. Today, over 2,300 delegates have registered to attend this second webinar on renewable hydrogen and green power fuel opportunities for South Africa. To hear what the British High Commissioner, Nigel Casey, and Minister Ibrahim Patel, and the presenters have to say on this subject. So there's clearly massive interest in this important topic as governments, civil society, companies and people on the front line of the decarbonization efforts prepare for climate action ahead of the 26th United Nations Climate Change Conference of the Parties, COP26, which is hosted by the United Kingdom in Glasgow from the 1st to the 12th of November this year, 2021. The webinar today will explore the policies business case, technologies, and opportunities for South Africa by renewable hydrogen and green power fuels in the transportation, chemicals, cement, iron and steel sectors of South Africa. In earlier years, a giant in science, engineering, and industry, Dr. Hendrik van der Beyl spearheaded and facilitated the industrialization of South Africa through the mining industry and the establishment of major state-owned enterprises such as Eskom, Iscor, and Sassel. But the world has radically changed since then, and I sense that South Africa is again at a crossroads now. We need far-sighted visionary leaders in politics, science, engineering, industry, and business to reindustrialize South Africa for the green economy, in which renewable energy, renewable hydrogen, and green power fuels will play a critical role. So I'm really looking forward to hearing from the leaders in the public and private sectors from South Africa and abroad that are assembled here today to hear their vision on the role of renewable hydrogen and green power fuels in South Africa and its economy. May I express a big thanks to the British High Commissioner, uh, uh, Mr. Casey, and to Minister Patel for honoring us with 
your insights. And to our co-host, the British High Commissioner in Pretoria, we are truly grateful for your support and the work that you've done and continue to do to promote and highlight the green power fuel opportunities arising in South Africa. I must also take this opportunity to acknowledge and thank the British High Commission, Sassel, Toyota South Africa, Linda in Germany, and Investec Bank for your most valued sponsorship and financial support for this webinar. But for now, may I introduce to you the British High Commissioner to South Africa, uh, Mr. Nigel Casey. Nigel Casey has been the High Commissioner to South Africa since April 2017. From September 2011, he was the British Ambassador to Bosnia and Herzegovina. And before this, he served at the British High Commission in New Delhi as political counselor and then as deputy head of mission. Nigel is a career diplomat who has worked for the Foreign, Commonwealth and Development Office since 1991. His career to date has been divided between London and five overseas postings. In addition to Sarajevo, uh, he has been posted to Pretoria, Washington DC, Moscow, uh, New Delhi. Nigel studied modern history at Beloyal College at Oxford University, and he's married to Claire Casey and has two children. So without further ado, ado, I would like to now hand over to the British High Commissioner to South Africa, Honorable Nigel Casey, to do the honors by saying a few words of introduction and officially opening this dialogue and introducing the Minister of Trade, Industry and Competition, the Honorable Mr. Ibrahim Patel, who will make the opening keynote address. Nigel, over to you. Thank you very much, Chris. I hope you can all hear me uh, and see me. I can't see myself yet, um, but uh, I'm hoping that you can see me. I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to you from my quarantine hotel in Heathrow, um, where I'm finishing out my posting, which says is a, it's a, not the way I'd expect it to finish my posting as High Commission in South Africa, but it's probably appropriate to these times. Um, but it's great to see, um, uh, first of all, such a, a fantastic turnout. I think I saw over 800 people when I looked at the last, uh, last time I looked at the ticker and, um, and such a senior turnout, so some really fantastic uh, expertise on the line. Uh, and it's um, a, a real pleasure and an honor, in fact, to have uh, Ibrahim Patel, Minister, uh, join us today. I know he's incredibly busy man and it's an honor for me to be the one to introduce him. Let me um, just explain in five minutes before I do that um, why we're supporting this initiative and, and why we think it matters. Uh, so as Chris mentioned, um, we are looking forward to hosting the next big UN gathering on climate change known as COP26. Um, it was supposed to have taken place in uh, last November in Glasgow. Um, but when the COVID pandemic broke, uh, we agreed to postpone it because it's really important that these events are held in person to create the, the sense of uh, momentum and, and pressure that's needed amongst leaders to crack these really difficult issues. Um, we are determined to hold that event in, in, in November of this year in Glasgow and in person, uh, notwithstanding the, the, the COVID related challenges around travel. Um, and uh, the key to success at Glasgow is not, um, as in the past, about, about negotiating a new treaty. We have a very good framework already, thanks to the deal that was signed by leaders in Paris in 2015, which, by the way, South Africa played an important part in brokering. The key now uh, is to deliver on the pledges made in that treaty, in particular by raising the ambitions we've all set respectively at home. Uh, and here I just want to welcome the release recently of um, South Africa's um, new draft new nationally determined contribution for public consultation by Minister Creasy and her team. Uh, we recognize that this has greater ambition than the, the preceding version and we hope that the public consultation phase, which I know a number of you will engage in, will support conversations around even greater ambition. Because from our perspective, the, the private sector um, is where a lot of the opportunity lies to support the realization of greater ambition and the private sector is well placed to help shape a vision for a low carbon future that South Africa can present and in Glasgow to the investment community, uh, which is keen to put its money behind uh, green solutions and sustainable growth. 
So the, the world is rapidly accelerating along its pathways to decarbonisation. It's important that South Africa grasps that opportunity, um, which will encourage investment and growth in green industries, can create uh, sustainable jobs here for the future. And in our view, uh, green hydrogen is one of the exciting growth sectors that can play a major role in our future economies. And it's a sector uh, in which we think South Africa has a major competitive advantage. Uh, hydrogen is, is the lightest, it's the most abundant chemical element in the universe. It could provide a clean source of fuel and heat for our homes, transport and industry. Um, and we believe that hubs where renewable energy, um, CCUS and hydrogen concrete will, will put our industrial super places at the forefront of, of technological development. So we're pursuing this hydrogen opportunity with renewed ambition and raised ambition at home. Um, last year in November, um, the British government published a 10 point plan for, for what we call our green industrial revolution, which included a commitment to a hydrogen strategy to be published later this year. Um, our Prime Minister set out an ambition for the UK to generate up to five gigawatts of low carbon hydrogen production by 2030 um, and up to five with up to 500 million pounds invested in a bid to create a new hydrogen neighbourhood by 2023 a whole hydrogen village by 2025 and indeed beyond that a whole town running entirely on hydrogen. So we've raised our ambition. We're pursuing a twin track approach supporting both green and, and blue that is uh, with carbon capture production um, which um, will allow overall low carbon hydrogen supply to increase quickly which is crucial to getting us in, in the UK onto our own net zero path uh, and to bring down the currently higher costs of, of green production as technologies improve and economies of scale multiply. So we're keen to work with international partners uh, on all forms of low carbon hydrogen. I, I won't say more about the UK's interest because you're going to be hearing uh, from uh, a proper expert, um, Richard North, uh, from our Department of Business um, later. But just to say that we do believe South Africa has enormous potential to, to lead a green hydrogen revolution that could create both domestic energy, export revenues, and expand jobs. Uh, and that's why we've begun steps to support that uh, through uh, our UK so PACT program here. And specifically, we're working with the Department of Science and Innovation to uh, help the DSI and other stakeholders identify and develop the skills required for developing a green hydrogen economy through the TBET system. Uh, in addition to that, we're working with the Hydrogen and Energy Directorate in DSI to support work they're doing uh, to develop South Africa's Hydrogen Society roadmap. So we have to build on this um, with UK business and investment, as well as development partnerships, um, playing a role in supporting the growth of this sector in South Africa. Let me stop there, um, uh, and it gives me great pleasure. I won't introduce him at length or read his CV because you all know exactly who he is, um, but it goes, gives me a huge pleasure to hand over now um, to the Honorable Ebrin Patel, Minister for Trade, Industry and Competition in South Africa. Uh, and thank you very much for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to uh, the High Commissioner, uh, Nigel Casey, who is also the co-host of today's uh, discussion, uh, Chris, our Program Director, the business leaders who are assembled here today, including uh, Fleetwood Hrobler, the CEO of Sasol, and Andrew Kirby, the CEO of Toyota. Uh, to our global participants and experts, including Dr. Fernando de Cisternes, the Senior Energy Specialist uh, on Green Hydrogen at the World Bank. Our distinguished guests are more than 2,000 participants who have joined us online. Good afternoon to you all. On behalf of the South African government, and in particular, the Department of Trade, Industry and Competition, it's a great, a great pleasure to be with you today and to have the opportunity to make a few remarks. The way we power the world is changing. Through the centuries and as our technologies developed, we've turned to wood, to coal, to oil, to water, to nuclear fission, and to the sun and wind to power our communities and our industrial endeavors. Today, we stand on the brink of a new development in our efforts to buy, to bring cheaper and more accessible energy solutions to the world. And that is in the form of hydrogen energy. The hydrogen not just for South Africa, but for the world at large. 
it could provide to us a just transition uh, with the potential to decarbonize various uh, industry value chains and provide security of energy supply. And it can also contribute towards the achievement of the sustainable development goals. Hydrogen can decarbonize a greater range of sectors compared to renewable uh, electrical energy alone. And for that reason, the initiative today is to be very, very strongly welcomed. The global production of hydrogen varies between 50 and 70 million tons a year, half of which is used, of course, to make ammonia. But as technologies develop, the production of hydrogen to bring energy transformation is opening up new opportunities. At present, hydrogen for energy purpose uh, is estimated to represent between 1 and 2% of global energy consumption. The outlook for global demand for hydrogen points to a sevenfold increase by 2050, spread across various industries. The Hydrogen Council, which you may know, uh, is a global CEO-led initiative, estimates that the hydrogen economy will achieve annual revenues of more than 2.5 trillion US dollars and create more than 30 million jobs globally by 2050. Countries are now mobilizing resources to deal with the climate crisis. The crisis is real, it's pressing, and we need to move on it. There is a growing international interest and momentum in green hydrogen for the production of clean energy. A key factor involves hydrogen's use in solving daunting decarbonization challenges and transforming high emitting industries such as steel, cement, transport and petrochemicals towards cleaner production. Hydrogen is potentially the missing piece in the puzzle towards attaining net zero emissions by 2050 in line with the uh, Paris Climate Agreement uh, of 2015. South Africa is well positioned uh, to capitalize on the rapidly developing global hydrogen economy. It's a point, Chris, you made in your introduction and that Ambassador Casey picked up in his remarks. And we can become an export of cost-effective green hydrogen to the world. South Africa's rich endowment of renewable resources for solar and wind and for biomass power generation, together with the Fisher Tropsch technological capabilities, our skills, and access to platinum resources, places the country in an, at an advantage for developing the green hydrogen value chain and being a key supplier into the global hydrogen market. Our country has the potential to be an important player in this new space. By exporting to countries that have limited renewable resources to produce hydrogen competitively. In addition to good environmental conditions, we are also well endowed with a key ingredient critical for the hydrogen economy, the platinum group metals. PGMs are used in the electrolysis needed to produce green hydrogen and as a fuel in hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicles. South Africa has more than 80% of the world's platinum reserves and is home to the largest platinum mining companies in the world. There's strong interest in supporting the long-term sustainability of the industry and developing new markets and applications for platinum. Our resource endowment has to be translated into a competitive advantage for value-added manufacturing that can contribute to job creation, investment, the export of hydrogen and value-added platinum-based fuel cells. The start, of course, of South Africa's involvement in the hydrogen economy dates back to 2008, when Hydrogen South Africa was officially launched by the Department of Science. The vision of hydrogen and innovation has been driving the development of the Hydrogen Society Roadmap. Uh, and this is for South Africa. And it aims to integrate and create an inclusive hydrogen society so that an enabling compact 
uh, between industry, labor, communities, and government can be developed. A number of government departments play a role in the hydrogen economy, including supporting climate change commitments through policies and a, a range of public strategies. They include, and by no means uh, is this a full list, the 2019 Integrated Resource Plan, the Green Transport Strategy, the South African Renewable Energy Master Plan, and the uh, Renewable Energy IPP Procurement Program. Another key initiative in collaboration with the private sector includes a feasibility study to develop a hydrogen valley uh, from the PGM mines in Limpopo, stretching along the industrial corridor from Johannesburg all the way down to Durban. The study, which is driven by uh, the Department of Science and Innovation, will identify tangible opportunities to develop hydrogen hubs and infrastructure that can supply industrial users and fuel cell electric vehicle end users. The aim, of course, is to create a sustainable local manufacturing sector for hydrogen production and PGM-based fuel cells by beneficiating South African PGM minerals through mechanisms that can support a local and global market. We have to think beyond the opportunities locally, but utilize the skills and capabilities here. On the back of several years of collaborative work and investment in technology development, we please that mineral-based green energy solutions are gaining momentum with a number of key projects being pursued. My own department, the DTIC, has supported fuel cell demonstrations, component production, and it has, uh, there's, in, there's enormous opportunity in this to boost the industrialization of South Africa. And of course, this is with the production of both new energy components and the various elements of the hydrogen economy, and also by powering established industries in new ways. Let me use an example. Vodacom used imported fuel cells for its South African network. Working closely with the international firm that supplied them, we secured an agreement for the company to open a local factory in the Dube trade port uh, in KwaZulu-Natal. Last year, the company opened a 10 million US dollar plant that will create a manufacturing facility with an initial capacity of 1,500 fuel cells per annum. The technology is based on low temperature proton exchange membrane fuel cells, which is the same technology used by the world's automakers for fuel cell electric automobiles, for forklifts, buses, trucks, and of course by governments for various military applications. These fuel cells have platinum and palladium and contribute to the platinum group metals beneficiation. And in that way, they increase demand for the product and support sust sustainability of the mining industry and jobs in South Africa. The company has further collaborated with Invest South Africa uh, to start the process of deeper localization with initial local suppliers, which include printed circuit board assembling, wire harnesses, uh, pressure tanks, shield metal, manifolds, and vacuum-formed uh, vacuum ducts identified for inclusion in that supply chain. Now, I'm pointing to this, Chris, and, uh, and uh, colleagues uh, who are assembled here today because they show on small scale what is possible, not what we may be able to do, but we're currently doing. And imagine what more we can do when we scale up our ambition. Uh, this locally produced fuel, uh, fuel cells will complement the stock servicing uh, the world's second largest deployment of fuel cells, 300 units in the Vodacom South African network. And the industry reports that the fuel cells provide more reliable, robust power compared to batteries and diesel generators. The fuel cell market's biggest enabler will be the global rollout and application of fuel cells in transport. Electric vehicles powered by hydrogen fuel cells offer many benefits given its technology attributes, especially for long distance and heavy vehicle transport, such as buses and trucks. These include comparable uh, refueling times, long ranges, as well as space and weight efficiency. 
transportation initiatives with major fleet owners and OEMs offer an opportunity for the country to demonstrate and introduce green transport solutions using fuel cell electric vehicles for the domestic and export markets. In this regard, I can point to the green transport strategy, which uh, seeks to facilitate South Africa's transition to eco-mobility. And there's a, a range of, uh, of, of measures in there uh, on transport greening fuels and technologies, including, I point out, hydrogen fuel cells uh, powered public transport bus fleets. We're working with uh, a number of automotive uh, OEMs through the platform of the South African Automobile uh, Master Plan to accelerate the development of manufacturing capabilities for new energy vehicles in South Africa. In my first meeting uh, with the sector during this administration in August 2019, I framed a challenge to the large car makers in South Africa, namely to take Africa's largest car making sector, which we have here, and future proof it through the embrace of green technologies. The goal is electric vehicles. And as a transition, we're now focusing on hybrid uh, uh, vehicles using a combination of electric and internal uh, technologies. I see that um, Andrew Kirby is here with us today. And of course, he heads uh, Toyota uh, South Africa. Toyota has made uh, strides in this area. And later this year, by about October, I hope the, the first citizen in the form of President Ramaphosa will step into the first hybrid vehicle that rolls off the production line from our large scale commercial production facility uh, at uh, Toyota. We've had demonstrated uh, demonstration vehicles and we've had small scale production, but this will be the first big commercial scale production. And uh, Andrew and uh, his team, I hope, can be enticed to see this as the first welcome step uh, to be followed rapidly by the, by the next and bigger one, the shift to electric driven cars using green hydrogen technologies. Now to unlock these opportunities, industry and government will need to tackle head on the relatively high cost of green hydrogen, the infrastructure and fuel cells uh, challenges, global uptake driven by greenhouse uh, gas commitments and growing green finance options will in time unlock the required volumes and economies of scale to become economically viable. The rollout of enabling infrastructure will be essential to position South Africa to take advantage of the increased demand. We look to global partners like the governments of the United Kingdom, uh, the European Union uh, and Japan, among others, to join us in the funding required for this journey. What their citizens gain is a significant reduction in harmful emissions, as well as the use of those technologies to assist uh, in bringing down and uh, meeting the commitments that we've all made on, um, uh, on emissions. And they can then assist with the development and commercialization of an important technology that will be used across the world. The DTIC through a special economic zone program offers incentive support for investments and exports. There's now a proposed Springs fuel cell hub linked to the Gauteng industrial development zone that is undergoing environmental impact assessment. And the intention is that this initiative will build on current partnerships and skills capabilities uh, uh, to, to leverage uh, supporting infrastructure for fuel cell manufacturing and deployment. And as part of government's strategic beneficiation objectives, the DTIC is working with other departments, with the Industrial Development Corporation, or the IDC as we call it, and with industry to support the hydrogen economy and fuel cells development. The private sector is absolutely critical in driving this. And our role as government is to support this, to enable it, to be there as a cheerleader uh, and to back the emergence of technologies and, and cost-effective uh, ways of, of rolling this out. The IDC in particular is working actively with other parts of government and the private sector to support these enormous uh, opportunities and the potential uh, 
uh, that this, uh, these technologies hold for the world and for our economy. In the past year, uh, the IDC invested in feasibility studies and in early stage companies in this space. I want to point to two initiatives of the IDC to illustrate what's possible and to use this platform to announce an enhanced role for the IDC in the green uh, hydrogen economy. The first relates uh, to coal to oil technologies. The IDC was a founding shareholder of SESO and CEO Fleetwood Krobla is here on the platform today. The support of the IDC in those early years and since was critical to the development of SESO and the unique technologies that it has available, which has been world beating in its area, creating South Africa's largest industrial company with significant employment. Of course, at the time when the technology choices were made, the world had not been as aware of the reality of climate change. But as times change, we needed the IDC to address that reality, that reality of climate change. In 2011, I mandated the IDC to step up its funding to the Renewable Energy Program. Government had just launched the Renewable Energy IPP, and there was some skepticism in the market about the political will to back wind and solar energy. The IDC stepped in and actively financed those early renewable energy projects. Its exposure helped to give the private sector, uh, particularly finance sector, the confidence to participate actively. And today we have a large and growing renewable energy platform. Over the 10 year period, the IDC alone advanced funding of 14 billion Rand in 21 renewable energy projects. We need a focused effort to explore the opportunities similarly in green hydrogen. I pointed to these two examples, one in more traditional areas, uh, coal to oil, and the other one in the green economy space, which is renewable energy. I can announce today that I have now mandated the IDC to be the commercialization champion for the hydrogen economy linked to, to the Hydrogen Society Roadmap that was developed by the Department of Science and Innovation. The IDC's business model will incorporate the integration and enhancement of project development activities, including the creation of a focused industry planning and projects unit. As part of this, the IDC will drive the development of an industrial plan aligned to that roadmap that I spoke of to coordinate the efforts uh, in developing the hydrogen economy. The IDC will focus on identifying investment opportunities that will be progressed to enable pilot projects to be implemented in the short term. It will focus on creating the public-private uh, linkages that will be critical to the development of uh, the entire green hydrogen value chain. And I should say that will also enable the extraction of value from that value chain. I have further mandated the IDC to look actively to partner with the private sector in funding opportunities across the green uh, hydrogen value chain with a view to stimulating early adoption and creating traction so as to fast track the development of a viable and inclusive local green hydrogen economy. Uh, Chris, if the 20th century becomes known as the century of crude oil and nuclear energy, the 21st century will be known as the century of renewables and hydrogen. Government is committed to working with all stakeholders to advance the development and creating an enabling environment for the development of this new industry. Together with our collaborative partners, we will continue to support the development of the hydrogen economy and fuel cell manufacturing capabilities. As countries reconstruct the economies beyond COVID-19, renewable energies uh, and renewable technologies will play a critical role. COVID-19 reminded us, in a globalized world, if we get it wrong, the price we pay, all of us pay, is huge. Climate change offers that same challenge and uh, the technologies we're talking about uh, provides an opportunity and a solution. And it allows South Africa to play to its advantage. I conclude by saying that South Africa's economic reconstruction and recovery plan announced by President Ramaphosa in October last year 
places the issue of industrialization, of jobs, investment, and new industrial opportunities along the renewable energy value chain strongly on our agenda. In the annual performance plan of the Department of Trade, Industry, and Competition, and all of its 17 entities for this new financial year, I've included green, the green economy as a key performance indicator. The green hydrogen economy, if made commercially viable, offers enormous opportunities. We must strive to leverage our resources to grow this exciting industry and the economy of South Africa. Thank you for the opportunity uh, to share with you these uh, remarks. Um, may I now call upon uh, Nigel Casey, uh, if you will, Nigel, to thank the Minister and introduce our next speaker. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, thank you, Chris. I thought that was uh, really encouraging. I, I think um, everyone listening will have got the very clear sense um, that uh, you personally, Minister, and your department have really seen the opportunities from hydrogen um, and are looking forward to embracing that competitive advantage um, that we think South Africa has. So I'm really delighted to hear that. Thank you very much for your time. I know you're extremely busy. Uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, and I'm delighted that we've got a colleague of ours um, from the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy in the UK, Richard North, um, who is going to say a little bit more about uh, what we're doing in the UK to exploit the opportunity. Richard. Thank you very much, High Commissioner, and to Minister, of course, as well for your introductions. It's clearly a very exciting time uh, in South Africa with respect to hydrogen. Um, it's great to be here today talking a little bit about the UK's plan uh, to make the most of this. I'm just going to share my screen. Okay, I hope you can see my presentation here. So, to give you an oversight of the UK's plans for developing a UK hydrogen economy uh, and give you a sense as well of where we see the international dimension feeding into that UK economy and where the UK hydrogen economy can make a contribution to the international development of hydrogen. So, today I'm just going to cover briefly a little on the UK context. Uh, I will tell you a little bit about the forthcoming UK hydrogen strategy, which we will publish in the early summer of this year. A little bit on the Prime Minister's 10 point plan for a green industrial revolution, which was announced late last year um, with hydrogen as a key tenet uh, of the UK's vision for a green industrial revolution and a new wave of green jobs. And then a little on hydrogen's place more widely across UK policy, our twin track approach, and as I said, the international dimension. We will finish with a, a quick reference to some of the UK's partnering for accelerated climate transitions, transitions uh, support, which is taking place in South Africa at the moment. So the UK's context, uh, we're very proud uh, that we were the first major economy to legislate for net zero. Um, and we've set out a really clear vision, we believe, for how hydrogen will play a really important role in putting the UK on the path to net zero. Uh, by 2050 uh, with, uh, in, with earlier targets um, for investment, for jobs, mainly looking at the 2030 timeline at, at this stage, that is what the strategy itself will cover. Um, but uh, we have a really clear vision um, for hydrogen's importance and, and we're really keen to talk to international partners about making that a reality so that net zero on an international scale is achievable with hydrogen as a key part of that path. So, Underpinning this, uh, this thinking on the UK side, um, the UK's Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy and our Climate Change Committee, which is an independent body mandated by the UK government to advise us on, on climate change policy and what we need to do uh, to reduce emissions and get ourselves to our net zero targets, have both conducted analysis showing that significant amounts of low carbon hydrogen are necessary in our energy system in the UK in order to meet our net zero targets We've got varying estimates on what this might look like size-wise, but we're really clear that hydrogen uh, has an important role to play, as I say, 
equally, I think it's important to underline that we have a range of external reports and external actors who are corroborating that, that theory. So um, I've given a sense of these on the right hand side, as you guys can see here. Um, National Grid, our electricity network provider, um, is really clear on, on, on the importance of hydrogen, which is quite interesting given their backgrounds. Um, Aurora Energy, an independent consultancy that we work with and, and who are internationally active, have set out a range of scenarios uh, for how hydrogen could play a role in the UK economy and the international economy by 2050, and they're all strong scenarios. Likewise, we've got the UK's Hydrogen Fuel Cells Research Club Pub and Bloomberg uh, last year in May 2020 set out a really interesting report that said hydrogen could essentially meet up to 24% of the world's energy needs by 2015. So that gives you a bit of our sense of, of context. And then for us personally, why in the UK are we so keen on hydrogen? Why are we so clear that this is part of our future vision? Well, we believe that we have unique uh, circumstances that mean hydrogen can work well for us. And it's interesting to see that some of those compare very favorably with South Africa's position, as I understand it. So um, we have geography, geology. Uh, we can go into that in a little bit more detail later if it's helpful. Um, but also history and institutional arrangements. We're really working really closely with a strong industrial sector and with a strong power generation sector that we have in the UK. And I would second uh, what the High Commissioner said in his introduction um, about the, the private sector being key in terms of the way that we envisage hydrogen becoming a reality in the UK over the next few years. We work very closely with the industrial sector. Um, we're very proud of that, the, the strength of our relationships. Uh, we have a, a regular framework set out by why we consult with the sector on, on hydrogen. And that's one of the things that we, we think um, is putting us in a strong position uh, to take this forward and make a hydrogen economy a reality within the next 10 years. And finally, just to say, we've got a really clear vision as to how hydrogen uh, can perform a variety of really useful, really important uses in the UK economy, which we think are also relevant to international partners. So those are sectors uh, which uh, have become a lot clearer, I think it's fair to say, over the last few years as hydrogen's usages uh, and particular advantages have crystallised and become more focused, but they stretch across industry, particularly in heavy industry sectors, which are quite difficult otherwise uh, to, to curtail their emissions. Um, so we're talking about cement, we're talking about steel, for example, and chemicals. Equally, we see a role uh, in power generation where we can stabilize renewable energy uh, production. In heating, uh, where uh, there is potential to blend into the gas supply that heats the UK's homes, uh, equally, we could see a, a future transition to, to mainstream hydrogen as the kind of key uh, source of heating support in the UK system in future. And of course, transport. The minister uh, has set out a pretty clear uh, hint there at, at, at just how important hydrogen will be in South Africa's future transport mix. Well, that's a view that we share, particularly with respect to heavy transport uses. So, a few words on the strategy. As I said, we'll publish our own UK hydrogen strategy in, in summer 2021. And at that point, we're looking forward to a series of detailed conversations with, uh, with international partners about how we might be able to work together, share best practice and, and share expertise. And um, I won't say too much more about the strategy now, but it's probably helpful just to set out that um, this is something that we've taken a lot of time putting together, um, working very closely, as I say, with industry. We have a hydrogen advisory council uh, that brings together all of the key actors in the UK hydrogen chain, from producers uh, to transporters and distributors to end users down the line. Uh, and all of those views are informing our strategy uh, and will lead to what we think is a whole of system view, which, as I say, will cover production, supply, transport, right through to demand. So we're really gonna set out clearly how the UK sees hydrogen end to end having a key role in our economy down the line. It's really important as well to us to underline that for us it's a whole of UK view and I know that this is something that is relevant to many uh, other countries around the world who are thinking about hydrogen um, particularly those that have devolved or, or semi-federalized systems um, and different uh, requirements or different advantages in different parts of their, uh, their, their territories. So we're thinking very clearly about uh, how we can bring the different nations, uh, Scotland, Northern Ireland, Wales, as well as England into that picture and how hydrogen can deliver a just transition and deliver future green economic growth and crucially green jobs around the UK. 
we're really clear that hydrogen has potential to do that and we'll be setting out that why we think that and how we think that will, will take place in more detail in the strategy. And fundamentally on timelines, the strategy will look up to, to 2050, um, but, but really we're setting targets in a much nearer term because we're clear that we want to get hydrogen going in the UK economy as soon as possible, creating those green jobs, bringing that green just transition as soon as possible, and it will set out the actions that we need to deliver in the near term in the 2020s to make a hydrogen economy an increasing reality in the UK by 2030 so that by 2050 we are firmly on our, our path to net zero and indeed meeting our net zero targets. But we, we understand and we will set out very clearly in the strategy that we see a case and a need for action now by both government and industry working hand in hand in the 2020s to get this up and going so that we can meet our targets by 2030 to set us on that 2050 path. As I've said, it will cover uh, economic benefits for the UK. It will cover the roles of various actors, including uh, industry, government, private investors, distributors, producers, and a potentially a role for exporters as well. Uh, and it will touch equally on the importance of international collaboration, which I'll say a little bit more about in a few moments time. But I can tell you a little bit about what we've set out so far on hydrogen and what action we're already taking now uh, to, to make that hydrogen economy that we've talked about a reality. So the Prime Minister uh, set out a 10 point plan in November 2020, which uh, unsurprisingly contained a key role for hydrogen. It was one of the, 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 the 10 points that was set out as uh, being amongst the most important factors that will get us to our net zero pathway. So the facts and figures underpinning our belief are quite clear. As I've said previously, a five gigawatt target of low carbon hydrogen production by 2030. And we're really clear that we think this can support up to 8,000 jobs uh, in the UK's industrial heartland, um, which for anyone that knows uh, much about UK, UK geography and, and where our industrial sites are located, um, those are really important jobs um, at the moment, particularly given uh, the UK's kind of uh, current levelling up agenda. What are we doing to get us there? Well, um, we've already set out commitments for up to 500 million pounds of low carbon hydrogen production support across the decade. And we secured 240 million for a net zero hydrogen fund, which is committed out to 2024, 25 for capital investment in early hydrogen projects. So this, this money is about the UK government putting support on the ground in those industrial sectors in particular, the industrial clusters that I mentioned, um, where we're developing uh, hydrogen production and usage at scale so that we can prove the technology is working, uh, prove the pathway to those jobs, uh, and get ourselves to our one gigawatt production target by 2025 and put ourselves firmly on that five gigawatt production timeline for 2030 with a clear sense of practical on the ground experience and government support that leverages at the action that is necessary from industry and gives industry the confidence to invest now. So that's about us making our contribution to the mix uh, to put hydrogen on this path. Equally, the 10 point plan confirms that we'll publish our strategy, which I've just mentioned, but alongside the strategy, we committed in the 10 point plan to bring forward plans for a revenue mechanism that will support low carbon hydrogen projects uh, as hydrogen that really begins to ramp up and usage picks up over the next decades. So when we published our strategy in, in the summer of this year, um, we will accompany that strategy with a consultation on our preferred business models for hydrogen. I can't say too much more about that now, but anyone that's familiar, for example, with the contracts for difference models that we use for, for offshore winds uh, in the UK and, and indeed have been used around the world, um, will be familiar with, with the sorts of mechanisms that we might be looking at. Um, they will include setup support uh, and longer term operating support um, and what we're trying to do with those business models is show that the government's committed to supporting industry as hydrogen gets going, as costs are higher at the present stage, but we recognise hydrogen needs to come forward uh, because it has that key role to play, both environmentally and in terms of creating a just transition and green jobs. Um, and we're prepared to put money in to support that in the early years. We'll talk a little bit in the strategy um, about the super places that were also mentioned in the 10 point plan. I've, I've touched on, on the importance of those already. Um, and we'll also, uh, we also committed in the 10 point plan to that work that we're already starting to do 
alongside industry um, to to test the potential for hydrogen to contribute to to heating homes and buildings at up to 20 percent of the gas mix that currently goes in the UK system. So we know that UK pipelines are adaptable uh, and that we can blend uh, the gas mix that heats our homes and our, our businesses, our, our factories, etc., with up to 20% of hydrogen. But there's quite a lot of work that needs to be done to get there safely um, and to work out whether that's the most efficient way of doing it. But the 10-point plan includes a commitment uh, to doing so uh, in a timely fashion. That brings us to, to the trials that I think the High Commissioner also mentioned earlier. Um, we're quite excited about this in the UK. We think we're a world leader in terms of trialling that blending. Um, and we're equally excited to be setting to a set out plant um, for a hydrogen village. Uh, so entirely um, heated by hydrogen and powered uh, in as much as it has gas needs by hydrogen. That will be a reality by 2025. Uh, and later, uh, by the end of the decade, we're looking forward to a, a town entirely uh, supported by hydrogen which I think will send a clear signal, both in terms of government policy, but equally in terms of the confidence needed um, for industry to invest and unlock that, that green emissions potential and those green jobs. And um, if we can show that an entire town in the UK is heated by, by hydrogen by the end of the decade, uh, that will send a pretty clear signal uh, and allow us to make the decisions based on evidence that we need uh, beyond uh, 2030, if we decide that we want to make that a reality across the UK on a larger scale. And finally, um, the 10 point plan uh, announced uh, an overall one billion pound net zero innovation fund. And hydrogen was a key pillar um, of the projects that we're looking to support under that fund, which will look at innovative new technologies that will get us to our net zero target by 2050. So as well as being access, able to access the 240 million net zero hydrogen fund specifically, Hydrogen applications in the UK can also bid in and are receiving money from this one billion pound pot, um, which uh, is now up and running um, and is available um, to help look at hydrogen applications and unlocking the technology that we need to get us there. A couple of words more broadly on hydrogen's place across UK policy, which uh, I wanted to include these um, to echo the Minister's message actually um, in as much as um, it's clear that in South Africa there are a number of uh, policy papers out there that, that show um, or at least are beginning to show the thinking of, of where hydrogen can play a role across um, the economy. It's exactly the same in the UK. We had our energy white paper um, that included power usages um, for hydrogen published in 2020. Um, the industrial decarbonisation strategy um, for the UK that we published last month um, set out a pretty clear case for where we thought hydrogen could contribute to decarbonising our, our key industrial sectors. I think it's also interesting just to bring out that we published a North Sea transition deal um, in March of uh, this year also, um, which is quite interesting because it, it underlines uh, just how we think in the UK um, our oil and gas sector, which has been a huge economic contributor to, to our economy over the last 20, 30, 40 years, um, at, but which is something that as a result of climate change and wider economic change, will probably see a decline in production um, over the next coming years. Hydrogen has a key role, we think, in transitioning that sector uh, and not only preserving jobs that might otherwise go um, if the oil and gas industries um, alone were allowed to kind of take their natural course, Actually, we think we have a real opportunity to use our experience in oil and gas and reskill um, and, and bring that expertise onto hydrogen. And finally, uh, there's something about our transport decarbonisation plan, um, which I imagine is, is quite similar to South Africa's own plans, which mm -hmm. sets out uh, quite, will set out quite a clear strategy for how we think hydrogen can be used in decarbonising our transport sector. That we expect in May to June of this year, uh, once our local elections uh, and the related PERDA process is, is out of the way. So the message I would underline there is hydrogen increasingly mainstreamed across the UK economy with a clear vision of how it can play a role in different sectors. A few words on our, our twin track approach that will underpin that, uh, that belief. So, um, this may or may not be relevant to every international partner, and it will be interesting to understand how South Africa might um, see its hydrogen production taking off down the line. For the UK, we're really clear that we're pursuing a twin track approach. So not blue hydrogen, not green hydrogen alone, but both. 
I've mentioned briefly how um, the fact that we already have quite a large um, oil and gas sector is, is partly informing that. I touched a little bit as well on our geography and our geology, which are relevant to why we think blue hydrogen have a role. Um, frankly, um, we're quite agnostic on the colour of production of hydrogen, so long as it is low carbon, because we're really clear that we need to have um, hydrogen fulfilling that role and getting us to net zero uh, and being part of our clean energy transition. And we're really clear that hydrogen can, can help us to decarbonize those hard to abate sectors like steel, cement and chemicals. Um, but as far as we're concerned, so long as carbon emissions are kept low, we are open to blue hydrogen production as much as green, and so long as carbon is captured. But that's very much a sort of meantime approach. We are clear that green hydrogen will become the future. Um, increasingly, costs for green hydrogen production will fall. Um, we imagine, envisage that tipping point taking place at the moment around 2030. And so um, that's why we're putting a lot of support into our innovation and net zero hydrogen funds and our international collaborations. Um, whilst we're investing in, in our own hydrogen production in any low carbon form in the UK, we're really clear um, that we have a, a strong role in the innovation discussions, the standards discussions, and the economies of scale that will bring down green hydrogen production costs at around 2030. And we're really excited about the potential by 2050 for this new low carbon industry, which will be increasingly based on green hydrogen to take off, um, supporting, supporting probably around 8,000 jobs, we think, by, by 2030. But the estimates for the number of jobs that could be provided by this industry by 2050 are much, much larger. And then uh, nearly at the end of the presentation, um, a few quick words on our international dimension. So um, we're clear that hydrogen is a solution that's relevant across the world. Uh, and as I said earlier, we're really keen to work with global partners to support that, that, the growth of that sector and to understand how hydrogen can fulfill a different role uh, in, across the global economy, but we can work together to support that. So we think hydrogen has flexibility to meet the different capabilities and, and end user needs of different countries. But we're equally clear that by working together, hydrogen can bring significant cross-border benefits. So those are economic in terms of supporting jobs across borders, um, not only through production at this early stage, but later through trade and imports and exports, uh, which I think was touched on equally in the minister's intervention earlier. Um, but there's also something here about energy security we can trade hydrogen across borders and support one another where not all countries will have the same capability to produce hydrogen. That will be an important factor, an important advantage that hydrogen can produce um, as it, its, its capacity development and deployment is ramped up. To get there, we're really clear um, that there are three key pillars. Um, research and innovation to bring costs down. That's already happening quite fast with green hydrogen, but there's more that we can do by working together to get there. Equally, we're interested in policy dialogues. So it's great to be here having this conversation today and hearing a little bit about South Africa's vision for, for how hydrogen can play a role in its own economy going forwards. Uh, and equally, we want to work together on common standards so that our systems can connect and eventually trade as possible. And just briefly, um, the UK this year enjoys the presidencies of, of both the COP26 Climate Summit, um, as was mentioned earlier, but equally the G7 uh, grouping. And I think it's really relevant and really important that, that through our presidency of the G7, we have made it a G7 plus four format, of course, including South Africa, alongside um, other uh, countries, including India, South Korea and Australia. And I think that underlines just how much of an international approach that we're taking across the board, but particularly on climate change and hydrogen. A couple of quick next steps that we've mentioned previously. Um, mainly drawing together uh, the fact that our hydrogen strategy package will be launched in summer 2021. And as you can see above that, there are a number of steps ongoing, engagement with the industry, our hydrogen advisory council, uh, and to develop the strategy in the meantime. And then uh, I put a quick signal here about consultation responses. Uh, that relates to the, the, the business models consultation that I mentioned earlier, uh, and that will be published originally alongside the strategy, but just underlines very nicely up just how clearly we're working government and industry hand in hand in the UK to get this right and that that won't stop with the publication of the strategy. It's something that will take forward uh, kind of for, for, for years onwards as we roll out hydrogen in the UK. I won't dwell too much on my last slides uh, because I know that we've already mentioned the projects in place um, but I've included it here just to underline the fact that that the UK is working through its partnering for accelerated climate transition funds directly um, in, in in collaboration with South Africa 
and we're really excited to be to be undertaking these the skills project uh, which was mentioned earlier um, looking at how skills training can align with the future future job opportunities in South Africa and make sure that those jobs green jobs are there created and education and, and, and demand is linked up and equally we're really excited to be supporting the hydrogen society roadmap alongside a monitoring framework which will help show the progress that's made alongside that um, so I hope that's a, a right note to end on, um, having set out the UK strategy, having set out how clearly we think hydrogen has a, a, a strong role in the UK economy going forward, and equally how we want to work together with international partners, because we think this is a really exciting economic and emissions uh, tool for the world going forward. I'm really pleased that we're working on the ground uh, in South Africa um, to take that forward uh, equally. Uh, and I really look forward to hearing more about um, wider South African views through the rest of this webinar. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much indeed to Richard North uh, from the UK government uh, for sharing with us uh, the vision that they have for uh, the hydrogen economy in the UK and also for their role in uh, international collaboration in, in this area. Uh, it really is for me to thank you and say we are all truly grateful for your support and for the work that you've done and the work that you continue to do, promoting and highlighting the green power fuel opportunities that are arising here in South Africa. You've talked about your role in HISA and your role in, the, in, in, in assisting with a, a roadmap uh, uh, for us. And I think there's a lot that we can learn uh, from uh, your experiences uh, going forward uh, as we embark uh, in the early stages of this uh, process. So a very uh, big thank you uh, to uh, Richard uh, North. And uh, it's now my great pleasure uh, to uh, introduce to you um, uh, as, as somebody from, uh, from the USA. Um, and that is uh, Fernando de Cisternes. Uh, Fernando, uh, thank you very much for joining us for, from Washington DC. And if I may introduce you, um, uh, Fernando leads the Green Hydrogen Support Program at the World Bank's Energy Sector Management Assistance Program, SMAP. Since joining the World Bank, he worked with teams in West Africa, Latin America, and the Middle East on strategic energy planning, energy security, regional market integration, and renewable energy integration. Uh, Fernando has 14 years of energy sector experience, previously working in the U.S. Argonne National Laboratory, the International Energy Agency, Siemens Gamisa, Renewable Energy uh, Company, uh, and other organizations as an independent policy consultant. Uh, he has published works in the IEEE transactions on power systems, energy economics, applied energy, amongst others. He holds a PhD in technology, management and policy, and a Master of Science degree in technology and policy, both from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT. So it's really a tremendous honor uh, to have you with us, uh, 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 Fernando. I'm sure he's gonna give us some insights on what the World Bank uh, does in this field and the, hopefully the access to uh, uh, low cost finance that he can bring to the table. Uh, as we embark uh, on this uh, massive uh, and capital intensive program. So over to you, uh, uh, Fernando, and if you could please share your uh, presentation, I'd be grateful. Thank you, we can see your presentation. If you can put it into that full screen mode, thank you very much, that's great. Thank you very much, Chris. The, uh, the honor is mine. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Minister Patel, uh, High Commissioner Casey, distinguished participants and panelists. Uh, greetings from uh, Washington, DC. Uh, thank you for uh, this very warm uh, welcome. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure to, to be with you today. Uh, I would like today to uh, overview a little bit uh, what is the uh, vision of the World Bank about how green hydrogen could play a role in decarbonizing the economies in, uh, in developing countries. And also I'd like to highlight uh, some of the work that we are currently doing, uh, supporting some of our uh, countries with uh, the development of uh, green hydrogen strategies. So let me, uh, let me begin by, by sharing some, some motivation about why we're focusing on, on green hydrogen uh, today. 
Well, as you uh, very well know, uh, we are not on track to the deliver climate change goals. And uh, even if uh, we've been doing a very good job deploying renewables over the last two decades to decarbonize the electric power sector, about 75% uh, of the emissions uh, are being produced by sectors outside of power. So we need uh, deeper actions to decarbonize uh, these uh, other sectors. Uh, the good news is that uh, electrolyzers and fuel cell solutions uh, are cheaper today uh, with uh, costs that have been declining uh, strongly over the last uh, 10 years. Uh, they are more efficient and they have longer commercial uh, lifetimes. Uh, we have also seen a very rapid decline in renewable energy costs, uh, increasing the potential for green hydrogen to be cost competitive with fossil fuel sources in certain uh, geographies and applications and uh, to decarbonize uh, these, uh, these hard to abate uh, sectors. So what, what we believe is that domestic uh, hydrogen production from renewables could contribute to the carbonized uh, industry, transport, uh, buildings. It can offer a long-term energy storage for mini grids and island locations. It can reduce uh, reliance on expen expensive imported fuels like, like diesel or uh, heavy fuel oil. It can also produce uh, future fuels like uh, green ammonia or green methanol to decarbonize uh, maritime uh, transport. It can mitigate the seasonal variability of renewables. This is one of the greatest challenges, uh, particularly when it comes uh, to, to mitigating those uh, long durations of time where the wind is not blowing. Uh, so green hydrogen could help uh, increase that penetration of renewables. And finally, we think that it can provide reliable power in critical infrastructures and remote locations, like it could happen in telecommunication towers, uh, remote hospitals or, or remote schools. Now, as, uh, as Richard mentioned in, in the previous presentation, uh, there's uh, different ways to produce low carbon hydrogen. And we also highlight the importance to have a technology neutral approach. So I, I wanted to show this slide because as uh, most of our participants today, uh, will know that uh, what we call blue hydrogen, so hydrogen produced with uh, fossil fuel sources to which we apply carbon capture and storage to, to uh, capture those, those emissions uh, can be produced at a lower cost than uh, green hydrogen. The picture might vary if we add transportation costs of that uh, blue hydrogen to different locations. So uh, what I would like to highlight with this, uh, with this slide is the importance to do a technology neutral analysis that uh, fully uh, analyzes the production costs of, uh, of uh, hydrogen locally and also takes into account the, uh, the other different costs like, like transport and storage to come up with, uh, with an optimal strategy to supply that hydrogen in a, in a least cost fashion. I would like to highlight a few examples of how uh, green hydrogen could, could play a role. Uh, in different applications. And I will start with this example from South Africa uh, with uh, the provision of uh, electricity in isolated locations. And this is uh, a project uh, that uh, was developed by Hydrogen South Africa in partnership with uh, CSIR, uh, where they develop a hydrogen-based mini grid powering a uh, high school uh, in uh, Bestendorp. So uh, you can see there all the elements of the, of the mini grid. You can see the uh, uh, the solar panels uh, on top of the roof, the, uh, the hydrogen uh, storage in, uh, in red, the red tank, and then uh, the fuel cell in the, in the container. So uh, these solutions uh, are competitive already uh, commercially with diesel-based mini grids. Uh, they're not cost competitive with state-of-the-art mini grids, including diesel. There's a, there's a gap that needs to be addressed. And for that, uh, the World Bank uh, with, together with our partners are uh, ready to, to support with, uh, with concessional financing to narrow, narrow that gap. There's of course opportunities in countries with vast renewable energy resources. And I'm, I'm showing here the case of Namibia, but we have a very similar example in South Africa. These are countries with excellent uh, solar resources, with excellent uh, wind, wind resources, and in combination, we can produce green hydrogen at, at very, very competitive uh, costs. Uh, this also applies to the production of uh, green ammonia that can help decarbonize uh, local industries and services 
like the production of fertilizers, the production of steel, uh, freight transport, and, and also uh, to export uh, these green hydrogen and these green ammonia uh, to, to other countries. There are also uh, opportunities in the transport sector as it was highlighted by uh, the minister and previous speakers. Uh, this is an example in Costa Rica where uh, fuel cells and green hydrogen are being used to uh, power uh, hydrogen-based uh, uh, buses. Uh, we have also applications in the uh, railway uh, industry, particularly lines uh, with, uh, with low ridership that currently use diesel. So uh, green hydrogen could be used in combination uh, with fuel cells to, to displace that diesel and, and reduce the carbon footprint of, uh, of railway systems. As I mentioned before, uh, green ammonia is, is one of the key applications, uh, uh, not just uh, for, for fertilizers, uh, but also in another, uh, a number of other industries like, uh, like the production of, of explosives. Uh, and, and there are also uh, applications in uh, the decarbonization of the, the maritime sector. This is particularly relevant in countries like South Africa with, uh, with a deep sea port that can uh, export uh, that ammonia and, and, and use it as a, as a fueling location for uh, other, other cargo ships. More, more importantly, there's a lot of applications that cannot be electrified, like a number of uh, industrial processes for which uh, green hydrogen uh, could be used to displace uh, fossil fuels and, and, other, and other pollutants. And this is an example from uh, India uh, in, a, in a steel uh, production plan. And uh, importantly, hydrogen can be used to displace uh, coal in the reduction of iron ore in the production of steel. It can also be used in the uh, decarbonization of uh, cement uh, production, and it can also be used in other uh, industrial processes. So, so we're working to identify those applications and to uh, make sure that we, uh, can, we can leverage on those, those opportunities in the, in the context of uh, the industry. As I uh, briefly mentioned before, uh, the integration of renewables is, uh, is a key area, particularly when it comes to very high uh, penetration levels. Uh, this is an example of Thailand, where uh, in, in, a, in a project, uh, they're using an electrolyzer and a fuel cell uh, to uh, produce green uh, electricity and power a learning center uh, using renewal power that otherwise would be curtailed. So this uh, might be an important application in the longer term where uh, we start hitting the boundaries of how much renewables we can introduce in our grids with uh, uh, energy, uh, energy storage and other uh, flexibility options. And uh, we can uh, leverage on the, the long duration storage that, uh, that hydrogen can, can provide. Now, it's not all good news. There's a number of deployment challenges that uh, we, need to, we need to bear in mind. And uh, the, uh, the World Bank is uh, working with a number of countries to address some of these uh, deployment challenges. Um, many countries have been using hydrogen for many decades, but it's important to highlight that uh, hydrogen is a special uh, molecule, is the, the smallest molecule uh, in the universe, and uh, it requires special knowledge and capabilities to ensure the safe production, storage, transport, and use of, uh, of, this, uh, of this chemical. There's a shortage also of qualified engineers who can design, install, monitor, operate, and maintain uh, these type of systems. Uh, this is a problem that is not exclusive to developing countries. It also happens in the context of, uh, of the OECD and, and something that we need to, that we need to work on uh, very strongly if uh, we want this uh, technology to scale up in the future. As everyone knows, uh, hydrogen technologies are very capital intensive and we need to continue uh, reducing costs, uh, increasing the efficiencies if we want them uh, to be cost competitive uh, with other alternatives and to, and to scale up. One, one important problem, uh, especially in some uh, countries is access to water to feed uh, the electrolyzer. Uh, so it's important to understand what are the requirements uh, on, on desalination to produce that water. Uh, desalination and uh, supply of water doesn't have a strong impact 
on the cost, but it might, it might influence where the project is, uh, is located. Now, because of the high involvement of uh, CAPEX and, and the very uh, 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 strong decisions that will uh, remain in, in time, we need to strategically think about uh, how we're going to deploy the infrastructure, uh, what are the elements that we need to make sure that we uh, minimize the uh, production of uh, stranded assets. So in, in that line, uh, we need to develop hydrogen strategies to uh, identify a pathway uh, that uh, clearly outlines how we can meet uh, those infrastructure needs and the, se the sectors where uh, green hydrogen could, uh, could play a role. So we, we summarized some of these uh, challenges and, and, and provided more details on the opportunities that green hydrogen can bring to developing countries in, in this report uh, that was uh, published by ESMAP uh, last summer and that you can all access through the, through the link in the bottom of the screen. And I very much encourage uh, you to, to take a look at it. Uh, I think it, it very well defines uh, what are these opportunities and, and, and what are the challenges that we need to uh, overcome. Now, some of the uh, questions that countries are asking when they think about green hydrogen is whether or not it is better to be an early mover or to, or to wait until the uh, cost of the technology comes, comes down, uh, if there are any important competitive advantages uh, or any parts of the value chain where we can involve uh, local players, and if competitively priced green hydrogen and, and green ammonia uh, are available, if there are applications at the local level that uh, could benefit uh, from, from uh, this green hydrogen and this uh, green ammonia. So from, from uh, ESMAP and the World Bank, we are uh, providing support through our task teams to develop strategies uh, and create eventually the enabling environment to uh, develop uh, the, the green hydrogen industry that many countries are, are, looking, are looking for. Now at a very high level, uh, the main steps that we systematically follow with the countries that we are supporting uh, is to first uh, do a strategic analysis to understand the opportunities on the production side and also on the demand side. So that involves a very detailed analysis of what are the production costs of uh, green hydrogen and, and green ammonia, looking at different synergies between the wind and the, and the solar sector to, uh, to minimize the cost of, uh, of green hydrogen. We are finding that by combining wind and solar, we can achieve uh, significant uh, cost reductions in the production of that uh, green hydrogen. And then we are also looking at the, the different sectors in the country that could uh, anchor that local demand uh, necessary to uh, plant that first seed that will eventually uh, allow to scale up the industry in the future. So, so those are two things that we are systematically uh, doing with every country uh, with which uh, we, we engage. Now, the, the second step, once we have clarity on what are the sectors uh, that could benefit from green hydrogen and, and what are the opportunities to produce that green hydrogen is to identify what we call the prerequisites uh, to develop green hydrogen at, at scale. Uh, those prerequisites uh, are in the form of infrastructure. So what is the renewable capacity that will be required to produce the, the green hydrogen uh, needed to supply uh, local demand and, and eventually uh, exports? Uh, in terms also of uh, transport, uh, pipeline systems, and, and storage of uh, green hydrogen and, and green ammonia. But also looking at the, at the regulation. So regulations and standards that need to be in place to guarantee that uh, that production and that use of hydrogen happens in a, in a safe uh, manner. Now, uh, the third step is also uh, linked to uh, the, the local component, uh, the maximization of the socioeconomic benefits that green hydrogen could, could bring. Uh, and it has two main angles. First, uh, local uh, industrialization to enhance the role of local players in different segments of the value chain. So very much looking at the competitive advantages of the country and, and exploring what are the opportunities where local players uh, could play a role in that, uh, in that value chain uh, and then also uh, looking at uh, local development in the areas where some of these projects are going to be uh, are going to be located uh, through actions that increase the livelihoods of the people uh, living in those living in those areas. 
Then finally, the, the, the fourth step is uh, gathering uh, the, uh, the outputs from all of these, uh, all of these analyses. Uh, we develop a coherent uh, roadmap, identifying the near term and longer term opportunities so we can uh, very well understand what are the, what are the investment opportunities in, in green hydrogen uh, and, and how uh, the private sector can, can play a role in developing uh, all, these, uh, all these opportunities. Now this, this support is part of a global program uh, hosted in uh, SMAP. And uh, we are not just supporting these strategies, we're also generating uh, a lot of global knowledge and trying to bring these technologies uh, closer to our countries. Uh, so, so the report that I uh, showed before is part of uh, that uh, global, global effort. Uh, we are also developing a number of uh, online tools. Uh, some of the ones developed so far are, are focused on renewables and, and energy storage. Uh, also, we support in the development of systems of guarantees of origin to guarantee the, uh, the low carbon content of uh, some of the hydrogen that could be uh, traded between countries in the future. And then we also organize uh, technology focused uh, workshops and regional exchange events to learn from each other, learn from stakeholders, like learn from the, from the industry about uh, what are the market opportunities and, and how different uh, players have been addressing the, the challenges uh, to, to scale up uh, this, uh, this industry. We, we also do a lot of upstream work at the strategies are part of that upstream work. Uh, we also support uh, our countries with the uh, development of policies, uh, regulations, and standards. And we also support with the uh, building of capacity uh, to, to design and operate uh, hydrogen projects. And then uh, down the road, we uh, uh, also uh, support specific projects uh, with uh, pre-feasibility analysis, uh, operational support to, to country teams, and then uh, understanding how uh, we can enhance the livelihood of local communities uh, through a job uh, creation and addressing uh, gender gaps. And, and this is all embedded as part of uh, uh, investment projects uh, financed by the, by the World Bank. So with that, uh, I, I am aware that our World Bank country team has been uh, engaging uh, with the uh, energy and trade uh, ministries on, on green hydrogen and energy storage uh, in different uh, parts of the value chain. And we very much uh, look forward to continuing this partnership and supporting South Africa in uh, achieving its uh, decarbonization goals. Uh, thank you everyone for listening and I'll turn it over to you, Chris. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much, Fernando. Uh, isn't it wonderful that technology has enabled us to bring people from London, uh, from the UK, uh, from Washington DC uh, to uh, us here in South Africa where we can hear what they are doing and what most important for me comes across is the very high level of support that is available to us if we reach out and take the hand of friendship that is offered, uh, the support that is provided from organizations like the World Bank, uh, uh, like the, the, the British government uh, in their international endeavors. And we saw in our first webinar the support provided by the European Union uh, through the um, European South Africa Partners for Growth Program, there is indeed a, a strong spirit of goodwill and support out there uh, that can help us uh, uh, develop our own path forward based on our own circumstances here. So thank you very much uh, indeed, Fernando, for those uh, words. And um, with that, if I may just um, share uh, this, I hope it's being shared, uh, and, and then I can introduce our next uh, presenter. So um, it's wonderful to have had these international presenters uh, speaking to us, and uh, it's now time to look at the local situation, and I'm very pleased to have with us today Fleetwood Krobler, uh, who is the CEO of SASL and president of SASL, and uh, Fleetwood was appointed uh, president President and Chief Executive Officer on the 1st of November 2019. Before this, he was the Executive Vice President of Sassel's chemical business based in Germany. His association with Sassel began as an engineering student in the early 1980s when he received a Sassel bursary. So it seems like he's been with Sassel his whole life. 
uh, landing up in, in, at the top position. Uh, and uh, since then, he's worked at most of Sassel's operating facilities worldwide. And in this time, he has been exposed to a broad range of business activities and has extensive experience in Sassel's international businesses in March 2010, he was appointed MD of Sassel Olefins and um, Surfacants. It's now part of the chemicals business based in Hamburg, Germany. And Fleetwood has a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from Pretoria University. So a big welcome uh, to you, Fleetwood. Um, and if I may now hand the uh, floor over to you, uh, I'm going to uh, stop sharing. And if you can share your presentation, uh, and uh, if you can take the floor. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. Much appreciated. We, uh, we think the sharing is taking place. So there we go. So very good. So thank you, Chris, for the introduction and for this wonderful opportunity to share my thoughts on our vision for Sassel in unlocking hydrogen's significant potential. Before I start my presentation, let me take this opportunity to acknowledge the dignitaries participating in today's webinar, namely the Minister of Trade, Industry and Competition, Mr. Ibrahim Patel, and the British High Commissioner to South Africa, Mr. Nigel Casey. I also extend my warmest greetings to all the other speakers from the British Government, World Bank, Toyota South Africa, Linda, and Investec Bank, and to all participants joining us on this webinar this afternoon. So moving on to the next slide, um, as a final note of introduction, just please note Sussel's uh, safe harbor provision regarding forward-looking statements and definitions as it relates to the contents of my presentation that will now follow. So if I move on to the next slide, slide three. So as you've heard from the other speakers today, green hydrogen is currently enjoying unprecedented political and business momentum with a number of policies and projects around the world rapidly expanding. Sassel believes that it is the right time to tap into hydrogen's potential to realize a clean, secure, and affordable energy future for South Africa. And we envisage playing a leading role in creating this reality. Today, I will share Sassel's developing strategy on the hydrogen economy. In my presentation, I will cover the following areas. Firstly, focusing on the global hydrogen context and its growth potential, then moving on to why Sassel is uniquely positioned to play a leading role in South Africa's hydrogen economy. And then to conclude, I will unpack the critical enablers necessary to unlock the potential of hydrogen to reshape South Africa's energy landscape. Let me clearly state that while the perspectives I'm sharing today captures the opportunity we see with green hydrogen and how this will support Sussel's sustainable future trajectory, we are not yet at the point where this translates into fully scoped projects and frameworks, financial and other, that we can share with investors, for example. Through this presentation, I will provide insights into our current thinking and avenues that we are conceptually exploring Thus, the focus here is around the technical feasibility of concepts, which are still subject to a very robust lens of economics at the time in the future before decisions can be made. We will share the Sasol strategy and also more information around hydrogen at our Capital Markets Day later in the year. Moving on now to slide four. Green hydrogen can help tackle various critical energy challenges and is forecast for rapid global growth as the pathway of choice to decarbonize sectors such as long haul transport, heavy duty mobility, chemicals, the iron and steel industry, where it is proving difficult to meaningfully reduce carbon emissions. In South Africa, green hydrogen is buoyed by a number of tailwinds. I always refer to South Africa as being blessed with natural resources underground, its fauna and flora on land, and now we awaken to its national, natural energy endowment of sun and wind. So information on the renewable resources lists South Africa alongside Australia, the Middle East, North Africa, and Chile as the countries with the best 
renewable energy endowments globally. Secondly, a strong pool is created by the ambitious decarbonization pathways required to meet 2050 global emissions targets for carbon dioxide emission reduction. Furthermore, industry momentum and depth across the globe can be seen in the size and number of large-scale hydrogen projects around the world, the alignment with government incentives to support adoption and the scale-up of technology, the forming of ecosystems and partnerships by companies to fast-track the implementation of end-to-end -end solutions. All of this works together to create the positive spiral of innovation and scale-up that results in cost reductions for renewable energy and lately also mooted cost reductions in electrolysis, which again supports further investment and adoption. I believe that green hydrogen is at an inflection point in its development and commer commercialization to make this the feasible pathway of choice to decarbonize our to date sectors and its use as a carbon neutral energy source, as well as for energy storage in electricity generation. Moving on to the next slide. Decarbonization for Sasol is a strategic imperative and it is our aspiration to play a leading role in the establishment of a hydrogen economy for South Africa. We have significant experience in beneficiating natural resources through innovation, starting with coal some 70 years ago. We are uniquely positioned to play a leading role in South Africa's just transition. Given our broad experience in the production, use, and marketing of gray hydrogen, over the years, we have built the capacity to operate and manage complex integrated global value chains. Our proprietary fissure troughs and catalyst technologies are uniquely placed to enable the production of sustainable synthetic fuels and chemicals. In addition, a number of our global assets can be repurposed to take in green hydrogen to produce sustainable products. Built over many years, the Sassel Global brand has become known as a provider of technology and quality products supported by an active research and development program. Key to delivery on our aspiration is that we are also a trusted partner to government and other key stakeholders. Moving on to the next slide. Sassel currently produces approximately 2.3 million tons per annum of gray hydrogen. This hydrogen is converted into fuels and chemicals, which are marketed and sold in the domestic market, as well as through exports. Sassel's gray hydrogen allows for the seeding of new downstream hydrogen markets that will in future utilize green hydrogen to decarbonize. This allows for the simultaneous development of demand and supply infrastructure. Hydrogen from renewable energy or so-called green hydrogen or fossil fuels plus carbon capture and storage, so-called blue hydrogen, can be transformed into fuel and feedstock which can be used to decarbonize multiple sectors such as transport, electricity, industries like steel, petrochemicals, and refining. The projected cost competitiveness of South African green hydrogen creates new export opportunities focused on green products. The potential export opportunities include, include for example, green steel, green ammonia, green hydrogen, and sustainable aviation fuel, amongst others. And the latter one is a very interesting sweet spot for ourselves. Next slide, please. So when we look at our landscape, the technology that is set to lead production of green power fuels by the 2030s is called power to liquids. It means starting with renewable sources of electricity generation, using that to, to develop green hydrogen, getting a carbon source and then turning it in through technology to power to liquids concept, where there is essentially two components. So the first part uses green electricity to produce green hydrogen. Uh, you can't call green hydrogen green if it's not produced by green electricity, not 
in electricity coming from ESCOM or from nuclear or anything else. It has to be green. And in combination with carbon, carbon from unavoidable emissions or a renewable source, the, to produce then what is called synthesis gas made up of hydrogen and carbon monoxide. The second part is fissiotrope synthesis that takes in this syngas and produces a wax-like output from which green power fuels can be refined. Sasol is one of the world's leaders in fissiotrope technology. We know how to build it in different capacities, how to run it efficiently, and how to provide technical support, including preventative maintenance to keep it safe and efficient. With our FT know-how, we continue to improve the technology over time with an active research and development program. We produce distinctive catalysts that optimize the output for various forms of power fuels. We know how to handle the wax output in terms of storage and transport. And we know how to refine it optimally to produce power fuels. Companies around the world license our gas to liquids technology contract for our technical expertise and purchase our distinctive catalysts. We are also in contact with most power to liquids players to potentially become their fissure drops partner. We intend to be a global player in the emerging power to liquids projects, especially in the production of sustainable aviation fuel. Sassel is in the process of developing and optimizing its technology platform to address this emerging demand for power to liquids. Moving on to slide eight. Sasol is currently evaluating several opportunities to leverage our assets and fissure drops technology to support South Africa's energy transition. We are in the unique position where we can repurpose existing Sasol facilities and new investments to produce green hydrogen and a range of blue and green fuels and chemicals for the South African and export markets. We are in the process of exploring this in Sasselberg and Secunda. In addition, standalone green fuel projects are also being studied. It is in this spirit that I announce that we will be working alongside a consortium comprising Linde, Enertra, and Navitas, the LIN consortium, to bid in a concept for the production of sustainable aviation fuels or called SAF, under the auspices of the German federal government's H2 Global auction platform, utilizing our Secunda Sinfields plant. The decision to explore the creation of an SAF production demonstration facility at our Secunda operations is aligned with our long-term decarbonization strategy. Green hydrogen is one of the key transitional fuel sources that we are working with various strategic demonstration opportunities and partnerships. The H2 Global Consortium provides us with a powerful platform to support the development of these new technologies and their applications and markets. We believe the new hydrogen economy will be enabled by a partnership model. It is this model that Sasol will be adopting to enable the green hydrogen value chain. The creation of these partnerships will be critical for enabling South Africa Inc. to be globally competitive in green hydrogen markets. Through these partnerships, the country needs to build capacity and key elements of the value chain, such as renewable energy, electrolyzer technology, fuel cell technology, and sustainable carbon sourcing. Sasol's expertise in hydrogen and our extensive R&D capabilities combined with our special specialist knowledge of fissure drops technology supports our ambition to play a key role in creating South Africa's hydrogen economy. Moving on to the next slide. One of the focus areas for Sasol in South Africa is to provide a comprehensive and sustainable mobility solution. Hydrogen and electric vehicles with refueling and charging infrastructure form part of this sustainable future. Sasol believes Hydrogen mobility is a real opportunity for the country to decarbonize the sectors of long haul and heavy duty transport, mining and others. We see the creation of hydrogen hubs or ecosystems as a practical and affordable way 
to scale the deployment of hydrogen in the transport sector. In this regard, it is my pleasure to announce that Sasol is partnering with Toyota to jointly pursue the development of a proof of concept demonstration for a green hydrogen mobility ecosystem in South Africa. Together with Toyota, we intend to develop a hydrogen mobility corridor and expand the demonstration to a pilot project using one of South Africa's main freight corridors, such as the N3 route between Durban and Johannesburg for hydrogen powered heavy duty long haul trucks. To initiate the project, we have commenced the sourcing of fuel cell electric trucks. In addition, we are evaluating the installation of a hydrogen refueling station for the demonstration project. The demonstration will proceed as soon as various elements of the supply chain are available. An enabler for this strategic intent is the expansion of the partnership to include other companies and stakeholders along the hydrogen mobility value chain. This is to allow industry to gain valuable first-hand knowledge of hydrogen refueling stations, the introduction of hydrogen into heavy, heavy duty truck supply chain, and understanding the commercial drivers underpinning the hydrogen mobility value chain. During the pilot phase, part of the work will be focused on the creation of an enabling environment, including access to affordable finance, updates to licensing, regulations, and tariffs. Potential roles that Sasol can play in such a project include the supply of hydrogen, of course, a baseload consumer to decarbonize Sasol mines, partnering with anchor suppliers and customers in the long distance and heavy duty transport sector, an anchor investor in hydrogen distribution and refueling infrastructure, also leveraging the current Sasol retail network, and most importantly, a market maker role to bridge the supply and demand gap and introduce the technology to South Africa through proof of concept investments. To unlock green hydrogen opportunities, we are pursuing various demonstration opportunities and partnerships with the intent of enabling and taking advantage of technology developments and breakthroughs. Moving on to the next slide. Hydrogen is already widely used in some industries, but it has not yet realized its potential to support clean energy transitions. Domestic and international cooperation will be vital to create sustainable and global competitive hydrogen businesses for South Africa in. To accelerate the potential for green hydrogen, I believe there are several key enablers we can and must work on together. South Africa needs a nationally coordinated hydrogen strategy with action plans and clear targets, leveraging its global trading partnerships to underpin potential offtake opportunities. We believe that hydrogen can be incorporated into an energy council to further progress dialogue, government engagement and collaboration. The country also requires regulatory frameworks and coordinated project approvals to activate the market and assist early projects. The minister has already announced today that the IDC is positioning itself for such a role. Standards and policies along the value chain that ensure safety and give certainty to stakeholders and investors are also required. Local and international partnerships can maximize value creation along the hydrogen value chain. A further enabler is to develop hydrogen economy infrastructure in a way that support local communities and promotes sustainability. Assistance is required to facilitate access to affordable finance by attracting foreign direct investment and international development institutions. So Fernando, I, I think there would be much more focus on how the World Bank can also play its role in this region. In addition, strategic support from government is critical for funding the current economic gap until a structural break-even point is reached. Partnerships and joint ventures are required to share knowledge and expertise while diversifying the investment risk. And also promoting South Africa as a credible partner in the global hydrogen market for investments and trade. On the R&D front, research and innovation projects on hydrogen technologies nationally and with international partners should be promoted, as well as supporting innovation and R&D in the green hydrogen space. 
The hydrogen economy is expected to create new jobs. Development programs are therefore required for hydrogen-related education and training, focusing on new skills for the industry. Moving to my last slide to conclude. In summary, with a combination of renewable energy endowments, rich mineral resources and technical capabilities, South Africa should take a prominent, if not a leading role in the global hydrogen economy. Sasol is committed to work with government and various stakeholders in the reindustrialization of our nation. Hydrogen can play a key role in this regard in a way that will make us a major green energy export. Sasol's journey to green hydrogen commercialization has commenced in the context of the concepts I shared here today. Using our existing assets, proprietary technology, and integrated value chains, along with strategic partnerships, our focus areas under consideration and development for the next three to five years. And as I said at the outset, we will provide more details at our Capital Markets Day later in the year are creating hydrogen hubs via proof of concept, partnering to transition heavy duty mobility in South Africa, piloting opportunities to reposition South African assets to provide sustainable liquids and chemicals, exploring greenfield opportunities at scale, focusing on potential export markets, developing new global power to liquids opportunities enabled by our optimized power to liquids proprietary technology platform and an enabling regulatory framework. To this end, I've recently taken the decision to apply to the Hydrogen Council, which is a global CEO-led initiative of leading companies, and Minister Patel also referred to this uh, Hydrogen Council, with a united vision and long-term ambition for hydrogen to foster clean energy transition for a better, more resilient future for our planet. More than 200 CEOs representing global revenues, global revenues of around 22 trillion US dollars are members of this council. And I intend to choose and forge global partnerships that will help Sasol take our rightful place in the global hydrogen economy, as well as bring the right players into South Africa as investment partners. Guiding our work on this journey is our purpose statement, innovating for a better world. This is Sasol's reason for being. It speaks to do things differently and in new ways, and while doing so, making the world a better place. I said earlier that Sasol believes it is the right time to tap into hydrogen's potential to realize a clean, secure, and affordable energy future for South Africa. We are committed to playing a key role in creating this reality. This opportunity will, of course, not deliver itself. As you can see, there are several different moving parts that need to fall into place. But with a clear intent and enabling regulatory framework and collaboration, I believe there is a tremendous value to be achieved. I thank you. Well, wow, that has kind of blown me away. To see uh, such momentous announcements here today, uh, and there's been a whole series of them uh, uh, from your Fleetwood, uh, and uh, it is inspiring. And you know, in my opening uh, words, I spoke about the need for uh, politicians and scientists and engineers and industrialists uh, with real vision, and also you know, on, on a, a scale that we have seen before, uh, you know, with leaders like Juan Abayo, who, who who really were part of the industrialization, and now we are looking at the reindustrialization, the just decision, the mobility sector, the green aviation fuel sector. There's just such a a wealth of opportunity that you've described uh, and it's time I think now to reflect a little bit and digest uh, some of these announcements that Fleetwood has made uh, and, and it's very opportune now then to have a, a little break. We are running behind time ladies and gentlemen uh, but I think you will agree that, uh, that it, this is gripping stuff uh, that, uh, that really inspires us as South Africans uh, and uh, thank you Fleetwood for your presentation uh, it's now uh, 15.49, so let's just say it's 15.50. So I would like to suggest that we, 
reconvene uh, at about, uh, well, not about, at exactly 4 p.m., 4 p.m. So we're going to call a comfort break now for 10 minutes uh, and reconvene at, um, at 4 o'clock. Uh, thank you very much for your time, and we will see you later. Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back uh, after a well-earned comfort break. Uh, it's four o'clock now, and so we are due to uh, recommence uh, with this webinar. Uh, <coughs> and it gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce to you our next presenter. If I can uh, bring his uh, details on the screen, if you will just bear with me one second, uh, ladies and gentlemen, while I get on the details of our next presenter onto the screen. I hope you can see this, uh, but it's a great, if you can't, uh, my, my apologies, but I would like to introduce to you uh, Andrew Kirby, uh, CEO of Toyota South Africa. And after the announcements by, um, by Fleetwood in the previous presentation, uh, who better to have on now than the CEO of Toyota South Africa, which uh, which is the, the, the biggest uh, car manufacturer in the country, I believe, uh, and certainly uh, in their partnership that had been announced with uh, Sassel, uh, positions them to play a very important role in the decarbonization of the uh, transportation sector in South Africa. So Andrew has been president and CEO of Toyota South Africa since April of 2016, uh, based in Durban and Johannesburg, with overall responsibilities for production, sales and marketing, finance and corporate services. Uh, before this, he was the chief operating officer responsible for all operations from production to sales and marketing. And before this, he was the senior vice president, corporate administration, responsible for corporate finance, IT, human resources, industrial relations, business planning and corporate affairs. So really a complete all rounder in the business of uh, Toyota South Africa. Andrew has a Bachelor of Science degree in Mechanical Engineering from the University of Cape Town and completed the program for Management Development and Executive Leadership at the Harvard Business School in the United States in 1996. Uh, so he also has a Mechanical Engineers Government Certificate of Competency for Mines and Works issued by the Department of uh, Mineral and Energy Affairs. So a really uh, big welcome uh, to you, um, uh, and if I can call on uh, Andrew now to take the uh, stage uh, and uh, share your presentation. And we really are looking forward to hearing from you and what you are doing in this uh, new world of transportation uh, that uh, awaits us for the next decades. Well, thank you very much, Chris, and good afternoon to all the participants. And uh, thank you very much for this opportunity and also to the High British High Commissioner and Nigel Casey as the co-host. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to, uh, to talk and uh, to all my uh, fellow panelists. And I also want to thank uh, Minister Patel uh, for uh, his comments, which I think are very encouraging towards uh, how we can grow and transition the automotive industry uh, towards a uh, zero emission environment. This is a, certainly a very challenging uh, step for, for us globally and particularly in South Africa as well. And I must say Mr. Patel's taken a very strong leadership role in progressing uh, our discussions with us as, a, as, a, as an automotive sector. And uh, we're, making, we're making some really good progress. And in fact, this month are going to be uh, further refining uh, our transition roadmap. So thank you very much, uh, everyone. Andrew, uh, can I just uh, interrupt and say, can you put your presentation into, uh, into presentation mode, uh, full screen mode? Then thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, sorry about that. Thank you. So let's uh, jump right into it. I think that, of course, we all know uh, that we are facing a number of global uh, and complex uh, challenges. And we have been, of course, uh, struggling towards uh, identifying or at least resolving the climate change challenges, uh, energy security challenges, but more recently, 
of course, we now have the biohazards as well with the introduction of, of COVID-19. But what I think is interesting about that is it's accelerated our thinking. It's, uh, it's been, I think, an important element in helping us to rethink uh, how we can achieve our sustainability goals a lot earlier. And, and I think that's uh, certainly one of the positives perhaps, that we can take out of the environment that we find ourselves in. Let me describe to you uh, just very quickly some of the automotive trends globally and uh, the context that this will play for us as we talk about the future of, of fuel cells as well. Of course, there's a tremendous change towards the diversification of drivetrains, uh, battery electric vehicles, obviously connectivity digitization, but fuel cells, battery electric vehicles, plug-in hybrids have all established themselves as, as really important elements as we uh, transition in this extremely disruptive environment globally. The second one is around the regulatory pull, and we're seeing uh, the change in, in the approach of governments as being a very, very important element in terms of this transition. And so the industrial policies and regulations and subsidies are playing an enormous part as we transition to these new drivetrains. In and of themselves, very few of the drivetrains would have progressed as fast as they have in many countries had it not been for the regulatory pull. The other big trend is towards understanding that we really need to look at the localization and beneficiation opportunities in each country. And, uh, and as such, we end up with slightly different uh, solutions in different markets, different continents. And uh, in South Africa, we need to also understand that we have some unique advantages and disadvantages and uh, plan towards that and find solutions that are appropriate for our circumstances. And then the last one being the sustainability goals. Uh, of course, this is a key differentiator. And I think that COVID-19 has accelerated uh, civil society's understanding, business and government's uh, requirement for us to ensure that we drive this uh, a lot faster. Globally, uh, CEOs around the world have been uh, surveyed as to what are the big global trends. And what's interesting is they're not that distinct globally from what we see and experience in, in South Africa. Uh, perhaps the one difference is that South African CEOs are saying that the importance of understanding the mobility ecosystem is really important in addition to understanding new energy vehicles connectivity as, as well. When we look at the uh, environmental changes, Toyota has globally announced in 2015 that we'll be progressing towards um, a carbon neutral environment and set ourselves six very challenging targets, uh, not only zero emissions from the vehicles, but also establishing uh, recycling operations, zero life cycle emissions as well, uh, establishing plant zero emissions as we manufacture the vehicles, challenging the minimizing and optimizing of water usage, and uh, also establishing ourselves in harmony with nature. So these are certainly very challenging targets and we've been progressing to that. And as we do that, we're seeing a big shift uh, towards these new energy drivetrains. Of course, the exact mix of those drivetrains is going to be slightly unique depending on the environment. And for us in Africa and for us in South Africa, um, that will be a little bit different to, for, for example, China, North America, uh, or even, even Europe. We have uh, four different powertrains that form part of, of our new energy vehicles. Uh, I think uh, most people are very familiar with the uh, hybrid technology, which uses an internal combustion engine, an efficient internal combustion engine, plus a, a motor and battery. Of course, that has a lower cost uh, element to it. But as we move into plug-in hybrid, the battery then gets larger and uh, we can now uh, charge the battery. The costs also get higher. They give, give it even further higher as we then go away from any form of, of ice uh, engine towards a larger battery, a larger um, charging uh, capability and range capability to a fuel cell where the energy is derived uh, directly from uh, the fuel stack itself. So when we look at the different uh, mix of our powertrains, I think that there's a couple of different ways in which we can evaluate it. But if we look at the 
uh, criteria of being advantageous or disadvantageous. Obviously, from a fuel a saving point of view, and if you look at particularly from the tank to the wheel efficiency, plug-in hybrid battery electric vehicles and fuel cell electric vehicles have a distinct advantage, not so much with hybrid and of course a disadvantage with uh, internal combustion engines. From a CO2 reduction point of view, it depends very much on how the energy is, uh, is, is developed in terms of the well to tank. And uh, I think the presenters before me have very adequately described some of those challenges. Uh, so we can't just look at the emissions of a vehicle, we need to look at the entire value chain as to what the total CO2 impact is. And I think naturally, uh, from a vehicle cost point of view right now, internal combustion engines are still the most affordable, with hybrids being the next, plug-in hybrids depending, uh, increasing costs and it gets further even higher for battery and fuel cells. And the cruising range, which is a, an important element, particularly for us in South Africa and Africa, there's a distinct disadvantage for battery electric vehicles. And while that's going to, and has been increasing over time, it still comes with a cost to it. Recharging frequency uh, is of course uh, similar and one can understand that the recharging frequency on a battery electric vehicle is, is a lot more onerous and from a charging uh, time point of view. But as infrastructure, or sorry, as technology grows, uh, and battery technology develops, um, the recharging frequency, the cruising range, and the charging time will all reduce significantly over the next five to 10 years. And we also need to be frank about the fact that we don't have uh, infrastructure, or adequate infrastructure for battery electric vehicles. I'm gonna to touch on that a little bit later. And of course, we don't have anything for, for fuel, fuel cells. Uh, so there's no real single solution, uh, but each product has a, has a different level of or unique advantages that we need to take into account. So here, of course, green hydrogen uh, and fuel cells really do create an ideal zero emission environment for us. And there are a number of interesting advantages. First of all, from a safety point of view, hydrogen is as safe as, as petrol and diesel. It's, it's extremely reliable. They're less moving parts than ICE engines. Uh, hydrogen is more dense than, for example, uh, lithium batteries or liquid natural gas. Uh, we have significant range advantages. Refueling time is quick. Uh, hydrogen is obviously significantly lighter, and I'll give you some statistics on that a little bit later. And we don't have any of the disadvantages of pollution coming from, from mining. Of course, price is, a, is an important element, and I'd also like to talk a little bit about that uh, later. But in the long term, potentially it can be cheaper than, than LNG. And it also does resolve the tank to wheel and CO2 issues. And of course, I think it was mentioned earlier by presenters, we have an abundance of hydrogen available. In 2014, uh, Toyota globally launched the first uh, commercially available fuel cell vehicle with the, the Toyota Mirai. It was then updated uh, just at the end of last year with the second generation Mirai. And there's been significant improvements in the efficiency of the whole platform and the whole system. And you can see now, depending on the type of specifications you choose, ranges up to 750, 850 kilometers very good performance in terms of the overall performance of the vehicle and the power. Three hydrogen uh, storage tanks uh, that are stored uh, under, under high pressure and a significant improvement in the entire efficiency um, of the performance of the vehicle. And this is now really uh, creating a very interesting set of dynamics as we compare to other types of, of drivetrains. A number of countries all over the world have made announcements and have already started implementing uh, refueling stations. Uh, this information was as of the end of 2018, and we know how quickly the world's changing. And you can see, um, particularly in China and Japan, how they are leading this drive to establishing refueling stations. And this number will change uh, at an exponential rate over the next uh, five to 10 years. 
I want to make the point that often there's a comparison between battery electric vehicles and fuel cell vehicles, and they're really not in, in competition. Uh, they can exist um, together in a mutually beneficial arrangement. So whilst we know that the balance between fossil fuels generating energy and renewables is going to change and should change over time, there is definitely an opportunity for the electricity grid and the hydrogen grid to coexist and to support each other. And we need to be quite open-minded about the benefits and disadvantages of the two and how we can uh, create um, ecosystems that, uh, that support each other and support our overall country uh, direction towards a low carbon footprint. Mr. Patel made the comment uh, earlier on today about the fact that we as an industry have developed a master plan, we call it the Cyprogram Automotive Master Plan, and the time frame is towards 2035. Now, that might seem like a long period of time, but it's actually, for many of us, just two generations of, of vehicles. But we've come a long way. Uh, we've come a long way in developing a very deep footprint for manufacturing and localizing uh, components in South Africa and there was a very supportive and long-term view from government over the decades. First of all with the MIDP program between 1995 and 2012. This was followed up by the APDP program and now we have APDP2 which is going to take us a lot further and help us to really grow and develop our manufacturing base and very importantly help to strengthen and reindustrialize South Africa in fact, our aspirations go even further. We want to play a part in reindustrialization, reindustrializing the continent and ensure that we maintain our global levels of competitiveness. We've divided our master plan into some, some really aspirational targets, which obviously include increasing the volumes, but also playing a critical part in creating jobs supporting the regional market development in, in Africa, optimizing our, our local content, transforming the entire value chain. But really importantly, and for today's discussion, is the technology switch. Because if we don't change the way we localize, over time, the level of local content, and of course, the manufacturing value addition in South Africa is gonna slowly reduce as the portion of new energy vehicles starts to increase. And this is, of course, the critical discussion that we're having as an industry and with uh, the TTIC. And so when it comes to a hydrogen environment, we need to look very critically at, at the technology, at how we can also look at localizing that technology uh, so that we're not just import replacing. We need to think about how we generate that value um, right here uh, for, for everyone on the continent. I, I, and I, term at the continent, not just South Africa, because I think we do need to, to think about it from that perspective as well. If we look at our readiness and we uh, just think about the maturity uh, or infancy of where we, where we are, I think it's fairly, fairly clear that we have over 4,600 uh, internal combustion engine refueling stations, we've got the regulatory policy, we've got the access, the product, the costs are good, skills are there um, and market growth is, is good. When it comes to hybrid, plug-in hybrid and battery electric vehicles, we have around 140 odd battery electric vehicle uh, charging stations, which is obviously extremely small, but we also have very little demand. And the reason I, I assess this as a, as a triangle plus is that we are, we are making very good progress in discussing as an industry with government, how we can create that regulatory environment for new energy vehicles. However, we need to further develop that for fuel cells because there are some distinct challenges for fuel cells that are currently not covered when we simply think about hybrid, plug-in hybrid and battery electric uh, vehicles. Uh, and, and we need to overcome uh, some of the challenges of a immature technology and an immature uh, infrastructure in, in South Africa. What is clear, and I, I noticed on the chat group, I think many participants really understand this, but as the load of a vehicle increases and the range of the vehicle increases, 
fuel cells start to become a lot more interesting. And battery electric vehicles become a lot more costly. So purely from a cost of ownership point of view, there is a tipping point and there is certainly a, an advantageous area for fuel cells when we look at uh, various modes of transport. This is a very, very interesting piece of transport, uh, sorry, <laughs> piece of research that was done. And there are three uh, direct areas of infrastructure, total cost of ownership and performance that are key differentiators. And when we look at uh, the different size vehicles and the different ranges, we can see that a fuel cell vehicle will reach cost parity with an ICE vehicle um, distinctly from a battery electric uh, vehicle. Battery electric vehicles um, obviously have a lot of weight and I'd just like to quote a few figures to put this in a little bit of context, but if you would like to take a, a Tesla Model 3 or a Chevy Bolt, uh, their batteries weigh 480 and 435 kilograms respectively. However, with the Toyota Mirai 3 fuel tanks, that weighs 30 kilograms. So a distinct difference. So the heavier the vehicles and the longer the range requires more and more battery packs. This drives up, obviously, the weight and the total cost uh, of ownership as well. And so heavy commercial vehicles and extra heavy commercial vehicles and buses that do use long ranges become very interesting from a, from a fuel cell point of view. And we see uh, that they can achieve uh, cost parity um, targets much quicker and in fact, battery electric vehicles. What's also interesting is e-hailing services, where they have taxi services, for example, where they have distinct routes that are known routes. Uh, they really can't afford to spend too much time charging vehicles. They also become very interesting from a fuel cell a point of view. So there's a lot of opportunities for us to uh, further, further look at that. So when we look at uh, the comparison of, for example, a Toyota Mirai, which has a very, very long uh, range, quick refueling, fairly good uh, performance, not the high performance of a Tesla, as an example, um, but has some distinct advantages over that. Effectively, if we were to, uh, to compare a ICE vehicle with a medium or average fuel consumption, it would cost around 152 uh, per kilometer. And obviously with something like a medium size, and I'm not, not using a Tesla as an example, but a medium size luxury battery electric vehicle, that could go down to as much as 23 cents a kilometer. So there's a, a huge uh, cost advantage. However, uh, the current price of, of, of hydrogen is around 300 rand a kilogram in South Africa. And Japan has set a target of 52 rand 20 a kilogram. But there's also been a joint European Union and South African investigation to say that the long term price could be as low as 26 rand 50 per kilogram. If that was achievable, then the fuel cell vehicle could also achieve 23 cents per kilometer. So this, this becomes quite interesting. When you then look at, at buses, you can see the distinct advantage of buses or heavy trucks in the fuel cell area compared to a battery electric vehicle. However, the market size for extra heavy, heavy commercial vehicle and buses is relatively small. So reaching a scalable uh, product solution is not as easy. And we need to think about whether we should be including a portion of passenger vehicles as well to help us to um, develop the demand and help us to develop that, that infrastructure Clearly, heavy and extra heavy buses are, uh, have, a, have a bigger distinctive advantage, but we need to think carefully about how we can generate the scalability uh, to make these investments viable as well. If we look at what Toyota's done um, all over the world, uh, first of all, in, in Japan, we've of course sold the Mirai quite successfully. They've sold over 10,000 vehicles uh, globally. Uh, the, the, the buses are available in the market. We also have a modular generator, which is a, a fuel cell stack unit that's sold uh, for those that would like to use it. Um, we are piloting uh, trucks um, 
And just recently, there was an announcement by Toyota in, in, in Japan that they will be selling their technology to rail and, uh, and shipping companies. In uh, America, they also sell the Mariah and they're also doing a pilot on a long range trucks. In Europe, um, they, are, they have a bus in the market already and they're selling the, the Mariah passenger vehicle and they're also doing a pilot on long range trucks. And in Australia, they recently announced a new hydrogen refueling station. And of course they sell the, the Mariah as well. So let's talk a little bit about what some of the ingredients are needed for us to realize uh, hydrogen mobility. Obviously access to, to product the infrastructure. We do need a regulatory environment. Um, there's no regulation that prohibits or prevents us from selling hydrogen vehicles in South Africa, but we don't have the stimulus uh, support in terms of targets, in terms of um, incentives to help us to close the gap between the cost and the demand requirements. Uh, time to market, cost competitiveness, as I mentioned, and the skills and, and competencies. When we look at developing uh, a hydrogen mobility value chain, I think uh, this has been discussed to some degree, but we need to think about the well to tank infrastructure and also the tank uh, to wheel environment. And significant investments are required all along this journey. Obviously, from the energy source, the energy generation, the electrolysis, the compression, the storage, transport, storage, refueling, ultimately to the fuel stack, sorry, fuel cell vehicle. So, what are we intending to do in South Africa? So, we are certainly committed to creating a, a greener South Africa and creating value. And we've decided to investigate um, a number of pilot introductions of fuel cell vehicles in South Africa. Some of these might still take a number of years and some of these could be a little bit more in the short term. And at the same time, form important partnerships with key stakeholders to enable this. So as such, as Fleetwood mentioned just before me, Toyota has entered into agreement with Sassel. We're very pleased with their intentions and we think that they can play a very, very important part in helping us to establish an ecosystem and establish a viable pilot that can help to spurn the generation uh, of greater infrastructure investments and of course demand. So there are three elements that we are, are looking at. Uh, one is the passenger vehicle. There are very stringent criteria in order to be able to sell uh, this vehicle in, in South Africa and they include the requirements for infrastructure policies and regulations. And so we need to, we need to address those. And we'll do that in combination with the DTIC, but of course, uh, SASL. Uh, the second one is in the, in the bus environment. Uh, so in Europe, uh, we've created a, a partnership with Katana Bus, and uh, they are developing a hydrogen fuel cell vehicle. Uh, there are also similar restrictions in order for us to be able to import that from Europe to South Africa, uh, but we are, we are looking into that quite seriously. And then the last one is more long range, heavy load, uh, heavy duty trucks. And as was mentioned earlier, there are certainly some very interesting routes that we need to think about uh, piloting as a proof of concept and uh, slowly get the move towards a hydrogen uh, transport ecosystem uh, in place. This will obviously require a lot of uh, enabling environments for us to be successful but we don't want to wait. We want to take a intentional step forward and invest heavily in, in this pilot to try and establish uh, some opportunity for us to grow uh, the development of, of a hydrogen ecosystem for the transport industry. In terms of our roadmap, um, there are obviously a number of answers that needed to be uh, addressed. Infrastructure is, of course, one of them. Regulations, technology, demand, demand cost competitiveness, skills, uh, competence and time to market, all of them. We need to make sure that we can produce hydrogen efficiently uh, to make this viable and competitive. And from a supply chain point of view, we need to ensure that we can supply efficiently and appropriately on the logistics routes, especially when it comes to buses and trucks. Um, there's not a lot of flexibility uh, in terms of, of downtime. And then we also need to create the demand for fuel cells 
and look at what we can do from a regulatory point of view and from an overall uh, target point of view in terms of what do we want to achieve by when and how. And we're hoping that these pilots that I referred to earlier would help to unlock some of the social economic value, help to answer some of the questions around uh, how we can address um, some of these challenges. And in the longer term, we obviously need a very collaborative approach with government and the public. And we're very interested in partnering with key customers that would like to have fuel cell vehicles and, uh, and key partners to help us to unlock this investment in, in generating a hydrogen uh, transport environment. I think it's, uh, it's clear that there are some significant advantages and benefits, uh, sustainability, refueling time, performance over longer ranges, uh, the lower cost of ownership if we can get the cost of, of hydrogen down, scalability is certainly a big advantage and energy storage. There are, however, some challenges. The cost to produce green hydrogen in particular, uh, especially from a well to tank point of view. Uh, the infrastructure, uh, obviously there's a big challenge of the infrastructure all the way along the supply line. A technical competency, our CO2 footprint in terms of brown and, and green hydrogen, a product access and uh, availability, and then of course the government um, direction and, and regulations. So we're very pleased to be able to take taking this step and uh, of course Toyota globally is um, investing enormously in the move towards a hydrogen transport environment and in South Africa we think that there's a distinct advantage for us to be a leading mover in this area and support the country's uh, intention uh, to reduce our carbon footprint. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Andrew, for that uh, presentation covering the transportation sector and the opportunities uh, that Toyota sees in the sector and the role that they intend playing uh, going forward. Uh, it is uh, an exciting sector. You've touched on a lot of issues. Uh, you've touched on the issues of regulatory and support and policy support from government uh, to, to enable this to really um, uh, take off at scale and um, uh, given us a lot to think about, uh, you know, of the different uh, areas of application of electric vehicles, uh, whether they are battery electric or whether they are fuel cell, uh, hydrogen fuel cell uh, electric vehicles. Uh, but clearly there is a, a space in the, in, in the sun for, for both technologies. It's interesting to see it play out. Uh, and uh, the relative advantages and disadvantage in the different application areas will no doubt uh, determine their ultimate share of the mix. So at this point, uh, I would like to um, introduce to you our next speaker, if you can just give me a little bit of time uh, to put his uh, picture on the screen. Um, you can bear with me. I hope this uh, is right now. All right, okay, share. <laughs> I hope you can see it, uh, but if not, so let me tell you that uh, our next speaker is Dr. David Burns. He's the Vice President for Clean Hydrogen at Linda in Germany. And if you were listening closely to what Fleetwood was saying, Linda is partnering with Sassel, uh, you know, in this um, green hydrogen field. So uh, Dr. David Burns is Vice President and Head of Clean Hydrogen at Linda, Germany. Prior to this, uh, David served as Linda's Vice President for Hydrogen and Syngas Global Business Development. He joined Linda, uh, which was formerly Praxair in 2005 and since then has made significant contributions to the development of new business in the hydrogen and energy industries globally. Prior to Linda, David worked at Dow Chemicals, where he held several business management roles. Uh, David has a Bachelor of Science and PhD degrees in chemical engineering from the University of Leeds in the UK, and a Master of Business Administration degree from the University of Texas in Austin. So it's uh, my great pleasure now to uh, hand the floor to uh, David and to ask him to share his presentation. Thank you, David. Thanks very much. Let me just share my screen here. Thank you. You can put it onto full screen mode. Or, yep. Thank you. Hopefully uh, you can all see that now. Perfect. Uh, thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, good afternoon. Thanks very much for the introduction there, Chris. And also thank you to the British High Commission to South Africa and the EU Business Intelligence uh, for co-hosting today's webinar, which has been very informative and uh, very interesting so far as well. So I hope I, hope I can keep up that, uh, that trend. Um, so let me start, if, if you permit me, with a brief um, overview of Lindy for those, perhaps those who don't uh, uh, know, know about us. Um, um, we were following the merger with Praxair in 2018. Uh, you know, Lindo has grown to be a leading industrial gas and engineering company. I think our market cap's about $140 billion right now. Um, have about 80,000 employees around the world, uh, operating in about 100 countries. But perhaps more importantly for today, um, and we've also been doing business in South Africa um, and sub, sub um, Saharan Africa for about, since about 1927. Um, you know, through Afrox, which is uh, now 100% owned uh, Lindy company. Um, I think Afrox employs about 1,740 people, operates about 105 plants in 14 countries in Africa, and has successfully executed something like 170 projects uh, since 1973, about 70 of which have been full-blown uh, EPC. So we we have, um, we know, you know, we had to execute and to operate uh, um, in South Africa and Africa in general. So, um, in, you know, we consider uh, South Africa and Africa a great uh, region to do business in. But just getting on to the hydrogen story, um, you know, given, given the, the topic today and the, uh, the audience, I think we're all familiar with the, the colors of hydrogen, uh, how it's categorized today. But I thought I'd just a quick summary. You know, obviously conventional gray hydrogens produced from uh, steam methane reforming. Um, you can convert it to blue, uh, you know, going down the, the, the y-axis there to two and three by capturing CO2 and sequestering it to various degrees. Or if you're using a, um, um, you know, renewable power source or a uh, uh, biogenic feedstock, you can also make green, um, green hydrogen. And that's, that's kind of how it's all categorized today. Now, if you look at the, on the next slide here, the value chain, you know, where Lindy sits, um, and we occupy a unique position, I think, in, in, the, in the clean hydrogen value chain. We can produce hydrogen of whatever color, um, whether it be gray, blue, or green. I think I heard one of the earlier speakers talk about being agnostic to the color. And to some extent, we are. You know, we, we're driven by what our customers need. Um, but uh, you know, then we can compress it, uh, process it, liquefy it, and move it, whether by truck or by pipeline, to our customers. Um, and then we have the technology in the end use sectors as well, such as in mobility in particular, and also in the industrial sector, you know, where um, you know, we, we're looking as we go forward here to displace gray or black hydrogen with, uh, with clean hydrogen, blue or green going forward. So we, you know, in some ways we're kind of uniquely positioned. We have a lot of infrastructure in existence today, which is uh, indifferent to the color. So as we make more blue or green, we can use the same infrastructure. And obviously that's gonna grow as we go forward and see the, the market grow as well. Um, looking at how we produce hydrogen, obviously electrolysis, you've heard a lot about that. Um, you know, we, we invested in ITM Power out of the UK in 2019. So we're a minority investor there. And we formed a joint venture called ITM Lindy Electrolysis. Um, and through this, we have access to world-class PEM technology. Uh, for, for uh, green hydrogen production and um, developing some exciting projects. You know, a few here, there's one in the um, Refine One, which is the uh, Wesseling Refinery in Germany, a 10 megawatt project there with Shell. Um, we hope that becomes Refine Two shortly, which will be a 100 megawatt project, which um, we're looking for IPSI funding in, in the European Union. We're also developing a 24 megawatt uh, project in at our Loina facility in Germany. So that's just started execution. Um, so obviously, you know, things that uh, the projects are scaling up as, as we go forward here. And ITM in the UK is, you know, is already scaling up manufacturing to be able to produce about a gigawatt per year of PEM stacks. So that we're ready for that kind of growth. In the mobility sector, um, you know, we've been active in hydrogen refueling for a long time. We've installed close to 200 uh, fueling stations over the years. We can fuel at um, um, uh, 350 bar or 700 bar, uh, or with one of our crowd pumps, we can take liquid 
um, um, hydrogen and fuel at uh, gaseous and um, uh, put gas in the tank at those pressures as well. So that's kind of unique. Uh, we're also working under a joint development agreement with Daimler to actually put liquid on the truck itself. Um, we think that's going to be needed for uh, long distance, um, uh, you know, the long distance is required and the fast uh, fueling times required. So we think that's going to be a kind of a breakthrough there. Um, and, um, you know, we also, uh, I think and Andrew mentioned the uh, fuel station, the fueling station is opened in Australia, the Toyota did there. And uh, we, uh, we provided a fueling station uh, for that. And we're very pleased for Toyota selected us for that. So we provided the fueling station. And in that case, ITM provided the electrolyzer as well. So um, it's a nice project for us. Now, we, um, you know, that's obviously green. Um, if we look at uh, blue hydrogen now, Obviously, it comes, you know, we're, we're talking there about carbon capture and storage, utilization storage. Um, you know, it's a prerequisite for producing blue hydrogen. We've been active for a number of years here. You know, we have a portfolio of technologies, both pre and post combustion, um, you know, amine based or rectosol or, or PSA based for, for CO2 capture, as well as uh, years of experience operating uh, such facilities. You know, we are a big merchant per uh, seller and um, of, of co2 and we've been capturing it for a long time in the center there you can see one project in, in the netherlands ocap where we actually capture co2 and uh, pipeline it to the greenhouses greenhouses there in the netherlands to uh, support um, their uh, horticulture business um, that's a good example of a uh, utilization now if we come to um you know industry feedstock um you know, we're looking at, uh, um, you know, we've been supplying hydrogen for industrial users in refining and the chemical sectors for, for many years. Um, and we've developed something like a $2 billion business today around this, um, you know, for, for um, uh, primarily for uh, clean fuels, for desulfurization. Um, and, um, you know, as a need for decarbonization, becomes more of an imperative, you know, as a way to reduce to, to meet our climate change goals. Um, you know, we're looking that looking to carbon capture and storage becoming even more important. And you know, we're looking to help switch from grey to blue and green um, as these industries look to uh, to decarbonize as well. Um, and we're seeing some new industries such as steel as well, looking you know, looking to make green steel, where it's going to be important that we have a low low carbon intensity hydrogen available to help with that. Um, we're also seeing, um, you know, growing demand for power fuels. Uh, I know that's the topic of today's talk here. So finally getting down to, you know, addressing this topic, which is uh, um, both renewable diesel and also sustainable aviation fuels. Those, those seem to be the two key kind of, um, uh, kind of fuels that we're seeing develop. Um, and, uh, you know, based on their drop in nature, uh, which is a real advantage, we've been, we're seeing a lot of growth. And of course, clean hydrogen is uh, is key to their development as well. And you know, I think we heard um, Fleetwood mention earlier that you know the project that uh, we're working on with with Sasol. We're very happy that um, you know to be to be uh, developing such a project in in South Africa at Secunda, where you know along with our partners uh, Enatrag, Navitas, and Sasol, uh, making up the LENS or Lens partnership. I mean, we are looking at taking renewable energy, converting it to hydrogen, um, and then combining that with, in this case, biomass instead of coal, gas, gas, gasified biomass instead of gasified coal to make um, uh, sustainable aviation fuels, which will then be used to uh, you know, fuel, fuel aircraft um, under the auspices of the H2 Global Initiative, which the German government is developing to kind of encourage these kind of projects. So we're very happy to, um, you know, to be working with Sasol on this, and we're looking forward to moving this forward. Um, so I think this is a, a great example of, of uh, you know, using existing assets and technologies and building on it with, um, with new technology to, to really meet a need in the market and also to decarbonize at the same time. So we're very happy to be um, working with Sasol on this. Um, just to finish with a couple of success stories, I mentioned the 24 megawatt project we're developing in 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 Loina. Um, right now, we that will be also used to supply the 
liquid hydrogen is going to go to a ferry that we just that we just announced in Norway. So it'll be a ferry using hydrogen, and we'll be supplying liquid hydrogen out of the Loina facility for that. We also have a train, uh, 14 trains in Germany. We'll be running um, on, on hydrogen coming out of the fueling, fueling station we're adding there in Bremerwerder. So again, that's probably the largest uh, fueling station and certainly the first for trains. So that's up and running. And then just some examples there of carbon capture, which we've been do doing for a number of years there. Um, and uh, we expect to do a lot more of those and a large, much larger scale going forward as well as the demand increases for, for blue hydrogen. So um, uh, that was just kind of to uh, to wrap it up there. Hopefully, I caught up a few minutes for you there, Chris. But um, um, I'm certainly willing to take questions after we finished here if we still have any time left. But uh, thanks very much for the opportunity to uh, talk to you all today. Yeah, thank you very much, David. You have enabled us to catch up a bit of time, and it's uh, most welcome. So thank you indeed for that, and thank you for your insights on the real world of hydrogen, uh, the world where things are happening uh, by a major technology company and a major gas uh, supply company uh, playing a major role and uh, set to play a major role here in South Africa. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for your presentation. Uh, please note everybody that these presentations will be made available after the webinar, including a, a recording, a video recording of the whole proceedings so uh, please be sure that you will have further time to study this. So really now, um, uh, if I may ask you to stop sharing your um, presentation, David, um, mm -hmm. and also to uh, switch off your video for the time being um, and your audio for the time being. Um, and it's now really a question and answer time, you might say. Uh, and we have got a little bit of time for this, although not much, but I've been watching the questions with great interest. There's mountains of them, and we're not going to be able to do all of these questions justice. But I have been watching them to try and extract some uh, key issues and themes from them, which I would like to pose to the various uh, panelists uh, who I see there are on standby. So I, I'm going to pose a question uh, to one or other of the panelists, and if they could take it up. If I can ask the panelists to try and keep the answers short and sweet, uh, we don't have a lot of time, unfortunately. We are going to overrun this by about 15 minutes. Uh, I know that. Uh, but I think everybody will agree that it, it, it will be worth it. So my, my first question is directed uh, to Fleetwood at, um, uh, at Sassel. Uh, Fleetwood, uh, you've talked about the just energy transition. Uh, you've talked about um, the, 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 the uh, mobility sector. Uh, and the joint ventures or the, the, the partnering arrangements that you're entering into uh, of great interest, I'm sure, to, to many. Uh, but I'd like to just ask you, where, if anywhere, does ESCOM fit into the picture? Uh, you know, there is this dress transition. There are these problems with coal mines in, in, in Pumalanga. Uh, there are aging power stations that ESCOM has been talking about repurposing. Uh, and I'd like to just get an understanding of where the world of hydrogen and the world of ESCOM coincide or intersect, or if they do, in fact, or don't. Uh, but uh, your comments on this and on the comments of the just energy transition in this area of South Africa, um, the, 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 the old uh, declining areas of Mpumalanga, how can Sassel, which is in that area, make a difference? Thank you, Chris. Um, I trust that uh, I'm audible and uh, that we can proceed from here. If you can just talk a little bit louder. Thank okay, you. Thank you. I, um, I think, uh, Chris, it's a very relevant question now. I cannot, I cannot definitely not speak on behalf of ESCOM, but what I can say is that I've been part of the National Business Institute assessment of South Africa's journey to net zero by 2050. And we had some external consultant that's facilitating the study and the numbers and the backup analysis. And we have looked at the electricity sector um, as the first step into the journey of uh, industries that uh, this study analyzed. And with that, we have concluded and the work has shown us that uh, the path of renewable energy through renewables is going to be the best way to decarbonize the electricity generation in South Africa. Of course, within that, um, moving away from, from coal generation, there would be space for, 
for gas generation. Of course, we know gas has got a 60% lower footprint than coal generated uh, power. We also know that in the journey, there's also been an assessment of hydrogen, how it will play into the space. Keep in mind that hydrogen can be stored and it can be used at um, off-peak times to generate when the sun and wind is not available. And I think that's an ability that is also part of the pathway to think how hydrogen can play into the space to be complementary to your main power generation uh, kit that is installed in country. In addition, of course, to hydro, um, you know, hydro uh, electricity generation, as well as nuclear to some extent that still exist. And, and of course, there may be um, some, some understanding at smaller scale how that could be playing a complementary role to the, the, the rated uh, supply of electricity. So, so I do think, you know, um, hydrogen is part and parcel of the journey towards a net zero for the country in terms of electricity generation. And I would think that it is more complementary than opposing each other. Um, it is a journey. The, the trajectory has to take its course. We know that with this is what we talk about today won't happen in the next year or two. It's not a, and I always say this, it's not a light shoot that you can throw and you next day you move away from coal to another source of feedstock. You need to get infrastructure development going. You need to get the right economics in place. You need to see the cost curve come down on renewable energy as well as the, the, the way that electrolyzer cost would need to come down. So all of those factors play into this. And so then coming to the just transition, I think what, what we need to consider is that my mantra is, is that renewable energy is not our enemy from a job creation. It is actually our friend because we can create new jobs through the industrialization and uh, producing the the kit that we need for renewable energy installations and also for the hydrogen economy that we are booting. So both of those would play in the just transition moving from a, from a coal-based energy derived solution to a renewables and hydrogen derived solution. And in the process, you need to convert jobs. And therefore in Mapumalanga, both ESCOM and, and, and SASOL have agreed that in our procurement strategies of the renewables and the repurposing of old ESCOM power stations, we will have a specific focus on um, local content and specifically local content to be developed in Mapumalanga. So to, as to demonstrate that um, renewables is your friend and not your enemy from a job creation point of view. Thank you very much uh, for, for that uh, Fleetwood. And uh, I'm now going to pose a, a, a question. Uh, I, I know there are some people on the D, at the DTIC, uh, uh, the Department of Trade, Industry and Competition, who are on standby for the minister. Uh, but I have heard it said so often that the, uh, that, that the, the regulatory and the policy framework and the tariff framework uh, for electric vehicles is not conducive. Uh, and we've heard also, um, uh, it been said by Andrew from Toyota that there does need to be a very significant positive uh, role for policy and regulation and uh, no doubt also uh, in, in, in the tariff framework uh, to speed up this process, to make a more rapid change than what is currently taking place. So I would like to ask the DTIC, can they give us any solid assurances from what you've heard today, uh, you know, from people like Sassel and Toyota um, and, and, and Linda and, and, and the World Bank uh, of their commitment towards um, decarbonization. What policies uh, can you put in place to actually facilitate this and make it happen perhaps more rapidly than it is at the moment? Uh, is there anybody from the DTIC uh, that would like to take this up. If you could switch on your mic. Yes, I see Tandi. Yes. Tandi, welcome. Uh, is that Tandi uh, there? Um, uh, um, thanks, Chris. It's actually Yumisha Naidu from the DTIC. Oh. Um, I'll be responding on behalf of the DTIC. Um, as the minister indicated in his uh, remarks,
um, government as a whole are putting in place a number of policies. Some of them are ongoing, um, some are existing policies um, to support the transition to in the green economy as well as um, eco-mobility. A key one being um, the green transport strategy, which really looks at putting in place a number of measures to facilitate um, the move towards eco-mobility. Um, so we will, um, there are a number of existing policies um, and enabling frameworks in terms of the integrated resource plan, um, as well as a number of master plans that we are uh, putting in place, um, including the South African Automotive Master Plan, um, the Renewable Energy Master Plan, as well as the Steel Master Plan, which all includes um, green economy aspects. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for that. And thanks for keeping the answer uh, reasonably short. Uh, it really enables us to to ask more questions uh, in the limited time available. Uh, so thank you very much for that response from the DTIC. Um, I would now like to uh, pose a question uh, to uh, Fernando at the World Bank, uh, if he is there. Yes, I see he is there. Uh, Fernando, can you uh, give us an indication about how the price of carbon uh, and the carbon tax may in South Africa may affect the pace of change uh, towards this uh, green economy and, and the uptake of, um, uh, of renewable hydrogen. Um, and also, how does the carbon price of other countries, uh, for example, European countries, how, how, how will they respond uh, if their carbon prices are pushed up and South Africa's remain low? Uh, uh, you know, how, how does this carbon price impact on things, both carbon price in South Africa as well as carbon price of our trading partners? Thanks, Chris. Uh, it's, a, it's a very relevant question. And, and of course, as you can imagine, uh, carbon price or any, um, any active carbon policy will uh, shift the balance toward uh, hydrogen or, or fuels produced with uh, renewable resources, so so it can it can have an it can have a strong effect. Of course, there's a there's a cost gap as uh, I showed in my presentation between uh, hydrogen produced with fossil fuels and hydrogen produced with renewables. So so it can it can accelerate for sure uh, the the adoption of green forms of of hydrogen, and, and there there's a number of uh, of effects that can. Uh, be derived from uh, applying these type of policies uh, in in different ways uh, in different countries. So so we want to we want to understand better how how these can play out, and and we want to make sure that countries uh, know that uh, many countries that will be importing hydrogen in the future will require these certificates and will require uh, low carbon guarantees, uh, making sure that uh, there was no uh, CO two produced. Uh, in, in, the, in the production of hydrogen. Thank you, uh, Fernando, for, for that and, uh, and also for enabling us to squeeze in some more questions. Um, uh, I'd like to move on now to uh, Andrew uh, Kirby, Andrew from Toyota. Um, you talked about, you know, the, uh, you know, where hydrogen fuel cell powered electric vehicles fit into the mix and their competitive advantages. Uh, and, and we heard um, uh, we heard Fleetwood talking about uh, this partnership uh, between Toyota and, uh, and, and Sasol, or shall we say, a, a, a kind of a, a partnering uh, process um, in, in, in the transportation sector, which is absolutely fascinating for me. And it strikes me that, I mean, we know Toyota's one of their major strengths is in the taxi market in South Africa, the minibus, the mini taxi market. Uh, and I also read recently about the fact that uh, Toyota had developed a fuel cell product, uh, which they were going to introduce into vehicles. Um, and it's fascinating also to hear about, I mean, Sassel have a fleet of filling stations or refueling stations around the country. So they, they have uh, got uh, capabilities to produce hydrogen and to distribute it. And your vehicles from Toyota, the taxi market, the truck market, the bus market, 
uh, forms seems to be an interesting sector. But these minibuses seem to be somewhere in the middle between electric vehicles and and buses, uh, big buses or, and trucks. So I'm fascinated to uh, understand whether this huge market strength of Toyota uh, will be used uh, in the electric vehicle market and if it will go battery or fuel cell. Oh, thanks, Chris. Are you specifically referring to taxis though? Yes, taxis. Where do they fit into this mix? <laughs> yes, of course, of course, taxis are interesting because we we manufacture the vehicles in South Africa and exactly. have 95 odd percent attempt market share. So taxis in terms of the route, the load carrying capacity would be an ideal opportunity for, for fuel cells. The challenges though, when we talk about trying to move to, to that technology is the fact that the, the taxi industry is not a regulated industry and it's a supply and demand driven environment. It's one of those strange anomalies in the country where it's uh, essentially part of the public transport infrastructure, but not formally part of the public transport infrastructure. So for us to say that um, the cost is going to increase uh, by three or 400,000 Rand, because now you're going to be driving a fuel cell electric vehicle taxi, of course, will not be very well received. Whereas if we were to be able to say, well, let's pilot with a customer and we could take some burden share in terms of trying to make a, a truck or a bus route viable, that is a very, very different uh, discussion. So of course, access and, uh, and cost per kilometer is a critical issue in the taxi industry. It's very, very sensitive. And, uh, and we, we're obviously very much aware of the role that we can play in helping to mobilize um, the economy because that's essentially what's, what, what's happening. So this becomes, I mean, you've hit the nail on the head because it becomes the crux of the matter. Technology is appropriate. We have the technology, but we can't make it viable or feasible in that, in that area. And so I think it's more appropriate to pilot it with the three different elements that I mentioned earlier, being in passenger cars, trucks and buses, and if we can establish that and get the scale and bring those costs down, then perhaps we can look at uh, localizing fuel cell electric vehicles for taxis in the future. But battery electric vehicles would not be viable, not, not, not right now, because that would be an even higher cost. And you're not going to tell a taxi operator to stand and charge his vehicle every three hours. Yeah, thank you very much for those insights. I think it's cleared it up uh, in my mind uh, <laughs> uh, significantly. Um, so thanks, uh, Andrew. Uh, I'm now going to move on to Richard North. If you are still there, Richard, I hope you are. Um, I want to just uh, talk about, you know, green versus gray uh, hydrogen and, and also uh, importing versus local. I mean, obviously, there are some countries that are very well endowed with renewable energy uh, resources like solar and wind, uh, and, and certainly the UK is not well endowed with solar, I would imagine, compared to uh, other countries around the world like South Africa. Um, uh, but you do have gas, access to gas, um, and South Africa, on the other hand, has very good solar and wind resources but doesn't uh, have access to gas. Um, so my, my first question is, is, it, is, is South Africa got an advantage by being a f early mover direct to green hydrogen? Or is South Africa got a disadvantage because it doesn't have a route towards green hydrogen? Like in Australia, they have coal, so there's black hydrogen, they've got gas, uh, so, so uh, you know, gray hydrogen, and then blue hydrogen, if they do carbon capture story, and finally green hydrogen, they've got very good solar re resources and, and, and re renewable resources. So they, they, they seem to have a pathway where we have coal, but no gas, and, and but good resources. So I'm wondering in my mind, do we have an advantage over the Australians or a disadvantage in not in, in being forced? If we're going to go it, we're going to go green, uh, as opposed to going yeah. gray and green. And then, if I may, just quickly butt in with another question to you, and that is, should South Africa be starting with the export market of, of hydrogen and green hydrogen and green ammonia, and let the local 
demand sort of be the spillover from a very significant export market or should we be concentrating on the local market first and, the ex and not focus on the export market? Uh, where, where do you see our position in all of this? Yeah, thanks Chris. Um, so on production types of hydrogen, um, I, I don't know if it's slipped the time, but you mentioned grey hydrogen. Um, and I think I just want to be really clear that that's, that's not part of what the UK envisages kind of our future energy mix, uh, including, and we certainly wouldn't be encouraging anyone to look at grey hydrogen for emissions reasons. I also think if you get behind grey hydrogen now, you're getting on board with a technology that's been going for, you know, decades um, and, you know, fulfills a role in industry, for example, but that's kind of an old technology. So we, we definitely wouldn't be looking at that. But primarily from that kind of um, the emissions abatement perspective, which is really important. Um, I dwelled a little bit on the UK twin track approach uh, and why we're looking at blue hydrogen as well as green hydrogen, because that's really relevant to us because, you know, we have um, salt caverns under the North Sea, for example, which are prime places for us to store carbon. So we know that carbon capture can work for us and we have the right conditions. But we recognise that that doesn't work for everyone. You know, if South Africa, for example, doesn't have access to gas um, or other resources. You know, burning coal, for example, is, is hugely um, expensive and, and creates a, a hell of a lot of emissions. We certainly wouldn't be encouraging kind of blue hydrogen if it doesn't work for the mix. Our approach is to, to do what's appropriate for us. We'd encourage others to do that. And, and we want to talk to everyone about different methods. Um, so I would say, you know, um, bearing in mind what you said about uh, solar resources that are so plentiful and the price of solar energy has come down so much in previous years. We've talked a lot about kind of the competitive cost base um, that South Africa can have in producing green hydrogen from sources like solar. To me, what one of the things that's come out of this webinar is a really clear opportunity for South Africa there that would be kind of cause to miss. But obviously that's 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 one perspective. And um, on on your point about kind of exports and, and the sequencing of uh, domestic compared to export potential, I mean, obviously, um, you know, green hydrogen, uh, as well as blue at this stage, but certainly green is, is kind of an early stage. So um, it's logical that there will need to be a build up of capability, the skills change, for example, and the, the capabilities um, within South Africa to, to allow exports to happen themselves. I would say that it's it's not really a question of either or, one will sustain the other. So if South Africa has plentiful renewable energy, particularly in solar, for example, then um, from the UK perspective, we'd like to see you guys develop that because it will work well for South Africa. There'll be jobs in that, you know, there's prosperity, um, but equally, um, it, it would be to our advantage um, from a global perspective that you can develop and you can export where other countries don't have access to the same resources, you know, for energy security benefits, for emissions benefits. So I would say both for one of Savannah sitting on the fence and they will very much sustain one another. But given South Africa's potential, it would be surprising if it wasn't also being utilised domestically within a kind of near time frame, I'd imagine. Thank you so much, um, uh, Richard, for, for that uh, insight. And really now a last question, we're now at seven minutes past five, so I think we've got room for one more question and then we're going to wrap up. Um, David Burns, David from Linda, I mean Linda is a technology company and they're a gas company. So it's a couple of sort of technical kind of questions, though not very technical kind of questions, but questions that come to my mind. Where are electrolyzers going to be made? Are they going to be made primarily in Europe? Uh, are they going to be made in China? Are they going to be made in countries like S South Africa? Uh, I mean, we know that the solar panel market is so dominated by you know, mass production that, 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 that it's hard to see other countries making any inroads into the panel manufacturing <laughs> market. Yeah. Uh, but where do the electrolyzers uh, fit in in terms of local content? Uh, and where are they going to be made? And the other thing I've been, well, you touched on this, but it's just, I'm just struggling to understand. Can one use seawater for this application to generate hydrogen? Can one use brackish water, the kind of water you'd find underground, uh, high salt levels, you know, in the desert? Uh, mm -hmm. and, 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 and what is the quality of water situation like in, in being competitive? And the last thing is, how, what kind of load factor do you have to operate electrolyzers at in order to produce uh, green hydrogen competitively? I mean, do you need wind plus solar, uh, wind during the day and solar at night with a bit of battery storage to keep the 
the, the, the capacity factor, you know, running pretty high in order to get the price down. Um, yeah. Um, thank you. Quite a few questions there, so <laughs> if I can remember them all. Um, Try to all, squeeze them all in before you yes. go. <laughs> first of all, on the on the water quality, um, it may be ironic, but for water electrolysis, you do need high purity water. So you probably have to do a bit of desalination, but that's not it's not a huge power burden, but you would need to upgrade the quality of water. And in most most electrolyzers, water treatments already included. Um, so um, you know, of course, chloralkali today, you know, just you know, you can use brine to recover chlorine and caustic, and hydrogen is a byproduct. That's that's a separate separate industry. But for water electrolysis, you need do need high purity water, requires purification, and probably requires desalination if you're using brackish water uh, as a precursor. Um, um, in terms of where they're made today, you know. Um, People are looking to scale up to, you know, you're looking at gigawatts of capacity being needed in by the end of the decade. Um, nobody has that today. I mentioned ITM was building a gigawatt um, uh, factory in the UK. Um, other companies are adding gigawatts of capacity as well. A lot of that is in Europe. There's capacity in China, and there's also some capacity in the US. But um, I think as demand grows, you probably start to see capacity, manufacturing capacity being added in where the, where the uh, demand is, you know, in, Australia, Chile, it uh, wouldn't surprise me if you start to see factories being built there as well. Because um, that's one of the key things to driving the cost down is getting the, you know, driving the cost of hydrogen down is getting the, the capital cost down um, for the electrolyzers themselves. And part of that is uh, manufacturing efficiency, getting scale up, costs will, drive, will come down. So, um, you know, I think you, you hit on one of the, you know, what, what, you know, of course, South Africa plays a, one of the key role in, in PEM electrolysis in particular, just given the precious metal content that goes into the uh, into the PEM electrolyzers. So that's an interesting facet for South Africa to focus on, I think. Um, um, uh, did I get all the questions there? Um, Chris, the, uh, the, a, the capacity factor, what do you need? What kind of oh, capacity factor do you need to run the electrolyzers yeah. in order to become competitive? Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, to be I think part of that is, you know, what's the demand profile? I mean, if you're making ammonia, then you would want, you wouldn't, you don't want um, uh, ammonia plant to be on and off. Um, so you would look at adding a mixture of solar and wind. Um, I'm not sure you necessarily need batteries. Um, if you're making it for, um, you know, mobility, then you can store hydrogen. Um, so you could, you could get away with not having quite so much, um, you know, uh, high capacity factors. I think um, if you're probably looking between mix of wind and solar somewhere in the maybe the high you can get is 70. You see some down in the 40s. It's just a case that you add more renewable power production capacity or do you add more um, electrolysis capacity to capture the peaks. Um, but, you know, certainly PEM electrolysis responds very well to variability. Um, it's very uh, efficiency is, is good over the whole range. Um, it's really, it's really what the, I think the downstream demand and how easy, whether you're looking at producing chemicals or whether you're looking at producing hydrogen, being able to store that. And you know, one thing we've we've got in the U.S., for instance, is we developed a you know, hydrogen storage cabin. Uh, it can store up to six thousand tons of hydrogen. So if you if you um, you know have an, a saline aquifer nearby, you can you can solution mine that and form a hydrogen cabin. Then you could use that instead of you know be able to as a buffer or for hydrogen storage you wouldn't need to put in batteries and things like that. So it, it's it's situation specific, but certainly with PEM electrolyzers, um, you know you, you're looking at from an efficiency point of view not really being penalised um, um, from that point of view. It's just a case of can you produce enough? How much extra capacity do you have to put in to make sure you capture the peaks as well as um, accommodate the troughs as well of, of renewable power production. Um, but I think certainly most will require a combination of wind and solar, just as you know, the project we're looking at with SASA will be a mixture of wind and solar as well. Um, and uh, you know, some, some areas of the world like Chile and Australia um, and in South Africa to some extent are blessed with having good solar and good wind. Um, um, it, it might not be, you might not think that, you know, um, sunny and windy may not be always the best conditions, but it certainly helps from a uh, renewable power point of view. But uh, 
Um, I think South Africa and certainly the project we're doing with, with Sasol is going to be benefit from having good access to both. Uh, and that really brings us to the, uh, you know, anything like the number of questions that have been posed, but time just doesn't allow it. And uh, I've tried to capture some of the key issues uh, in the question. So thank you very much uh, for that, David. Uh, if I could ask you to switch your video off at this point, uh, and I'm going to um, uh, share a screen. Uh, David, can you hear me? Can you switch your video off? Sure, sorry. So it's now my great pleasure to introduce to you uh, the person who's going to have the last word. And I hope you can uh, see, his, uh, see his face uh, there uh, as I introduce him. Um, so uh, the, the Andre Wepana is the head of power and infrastructure finance and investment at Investing Bank. And let me just introduce introduce him before I hand over to him to say some concluding remarks and, and, and thanks. Uh, Andre is the head of power and infrastructure finance and he provides funding solutions for power and infrastructure projects across sub-Saharan Africa. In addition to providing debt financing, they also play a role in uh, as a, a role of a developer. Andre has been with Investec Bank for 15 years and has extensive experience in the origination, structuring, execution of debt transactions uh, within the corporate and institutional banking division. This includes both senior and mezzanine debt funding into the mining, power and infrastructure sectors across the African continent. Andre has worked with a range of clients, including large global corporates, mid-tier companies, and Project Africa, and holds an honors degree in accounting and taxation. So the floor is yours now, Andre, to make some concluding remarks and wrap this thing up. Thanks very much, Chris. And uh, yeah, I'll try and keep it brief, I think, in the interest of time. But first of all, yeah, just a couple of thank yous. A uh, big thank you to you, Chris. Um, Ellen and the e-business um, and the British High Commission for, for hosting today's session. Um, and thank you very much for affording Investec the opportunity to provide sponsorship for today's event. Um, thank you to the High Commissioner, uh, the Minister and all of today's panelists for their contribution um, and for taking time out of their busy schedules uh, to share with us today. Um, thank you to everyone else who was involved behind the scenes. And most importantly, a huge thank you to all the participants who joined us today. I do hope that you enjoyed the afternoon as much as we have. Just a couple of uh, very brief insights. Um, I think what really stood out for me today is the magnitude of the opportunity for South Africa uh, as a country. So, you know, a couple of key themes that came out of the, the various presentations. Um, you know, firstly, the cost of solar and wind power having fallen so dramatically over the past 10 years. Um, and, and it does create an opportunity for a cheap and reliable source of hydrogen, um, which is now possible for the production of green fuels. Um, advances in electrolyzers and fuel technologies Fuel cell technologies now mean that large-scale hydrogen production is cheaper and more accessible than ever before. And the integration of green hydrogen to make liquid fuels and petrochemicals using established, established technologies is another exciting opportunity, which South Africa is in a prime position to exploit. There are substantial export opportunities for su such green fuels and petrochemicals um, for South Africa. Um, another opportunity is, the, is, the, is where green hydrogen could also um, substitute fert fertilizer and explosive imports, uh, where currently a material percentage of these um, are imported. And finally, the development of hydrogen fuel cells would create local demand for platinum, uh, where the metal is used as, as a catalyst. And the growth of, this, of these industries would really have, have two major knock-on effects of creating jobs and moving the country towards a lower carbon economy. And so finally, just a couple of thoughts from our side on the, on the financing aspects of these exciting new developments. At Investec, we pride ourselves in partnering with our clients to provide bespoke funding solutions that are required in order for them to succeed um, in their business or in their projects. And you know, as financiers, project financiers, we're typically looking to provide funding to projects that have, you know, in a specific sector, you know, we're looking for certain key factors. Um, one is a, is a well-structured project with strong sponsors who understand the technical aspects of the project. We're looking for a well understood regulatory framework, with policy certainty, with strong partnership between government and the private sector. And we're looking for projects that, um, that contribute 
to the overall well-being of society and the environment in which we live. And so in this light, um, what I found so encouraging today is to see the successful collaboration between different stakeholders um, and the collective will uh, to succeed, which, which bodes well for success in raising funding for future projects in this space and the overall development of this very exciting sector. And so I'll wrap up there and say thank you very much. Yeah, thank you again uh, to Andre for those closing words. And uh, really on uh, my side, I just hope that uh, people have listened carefully and I'm sure people will be studying the announcements by Toyota, by Sassel, listening very carefully to what is being said, the names of the companies. I mean, a few companies that I heard mentioned were Sassel, Toyota, Linda. We know there being a big announcements by Air Liquide today. There were mention of Enatrag, Navitas, the European Union, uh, the, Europe, uh, the British High Commission. Uh, we've heard about Investec Bank, the World Bank. Uh, so there's some really interesting names that are starting to crystallize and you may have seen some of them in the very first webinar that we did on, on hydrogen. We've seen more of them uh, today uh, during the second uh, hydrogen and green power fuels uh, uh, webinar. And we are planning the third uh, webinar for the end of May, towards the end of May, uh, the third hydrogen and green power fuels webinar. Uh, it's going to be really exciting uh, to look at other opportunities in South Africa, for example, the mining opportunities uh, and, and other really interesting areas, iron and steel, uh, cement, uh, uh, chemicals industries, uh, all of which make this space uh, incredibly exciting uh, with massive opportunities, massive business opportunities, massive job opportunities, and massive opportunities for a just transition uh, in South Africa, uh, just energy transition towards uh, the green economy. So from me, uh, Chris Yelland, thank you very much uh, for joining us today. And we look forward uh, to seeing you at our next uh, webinar, which will be coming up shortly. Uh, thanks, everybody, and good night.